Yes, kia ora whanau. welcome back into Run It Straight here in the studio, round 25 review and what a cracker of rugby league we had. We had obviously the Melbourne Storm winning the minor premierships two weeks early, the best and the most consistent team over the 25 weeks so far. But before we kick off our show, as always, I'm going to do something a little different here. I'm going to go front to back. I'm going to go Willie Korawurumu, you're in the house. We've got Dills <laughs> over there, and then we've got the man with all the energy. <laughs> and wearing, go. yes, there it is, and wearing the Canberra Raiders shirt because of the upset. Efren, welcome in, brothers. Morning, morning, morning. We good? Excellent morning. weekend. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty good. Pretty First, good. have a good weekend? Yeah, great weekend. Great weekend of footy. As you said, Melbourne got the minor premiership. Battles for the fourth position. Battles in the eight, battles at the bottom, battles everywhere. Big couple of weeks. How good's that, eh? I can't Weekend wait for this league. one. This is going to be a cracker. And there may be some mitigations going on here. <laughs> but <laughs> enough of my talk. He will bring the man straight in. He has all the ideas. Ephraim, <clears throat> what do we got, man? Well, today we'll kick off the show with our news as usual. And first up, we've got some re-signings news. So for the Roosters and the Cowboys, uh, the Roosters, they've re-signed both their origin forwards, mm. uh, Connor Watson and Spencer Lenu, uh, on two-year contract extensions each which is good for them and then the Cowboys have uh, extended one year each for Jake Clifford obviously played mm. very well in his time and Semi Valame as well what do you guys think of those re-signings yeah I think the, the Roosters one's perfect I think they've got a bit of money now to to be able to upgrade a couple of these players and, and extend their contracts and two key players I think obviously on the back of their performances and what they can bring and deliver and the versatility especially for Connor Watson uh, to the club and where the position he can play I think he's played in the centres as well so he can play through the halves in the, in the middle of the park could play hooker can play 13 much we could cover front row if he had to and then obviously Spencer the new we all know that he's most really if not the best player that comes off the bench that brings the impact and has an opportunity that of late that's been starting as well. So I think, you know, some couple of great signings for the Roosters. Those two boys are key. And obviously Jake Clifford, you know, after his performance last week, well, not the weekend just gone, the weekend before, outstanding. Um, I think it's a great signing. Got a great boot, great young kid, got some good talent and got the good players around him. I think they're all great signings for both clubs. Yeah, agreed. Especially for the Roosters. <laughs> I dare say Connor Watson would have been a cheap pickup from Newcastle at the time, coming in, add some versatility that he's given. But in that, when he came, he was challenging the likes of um, Lachlan Lamb and Drew Hutchinson, you know, for game time. But over the course of his time at the Roosters, he's grown bigger and bigger with his performances. I dare say the Roosters would have liked to have signed him a little bit before mm. the Origin series. You know, his value just went through the roof mm -hmm. after his Origin debut and, and what he did during that series to come through. Um, I underrated him, <clears throat> for one. He was outstanding in Origin, and my opinion of him definitely changed. So I dare say he's picked up a, a lot more in his contract than he would have before the Origin series had come, so he's going to be great for them. Spencer Lanieu. Yeah, one of the players of the Origin series for me, mm. his uh, his transformation, especially being able to start games in the absence of Jared Wodeo Hargraves for the Roosters, is is become a better player at the Roosters. He stepped up. He's playing a lot more game time mm. and being effective for the game time that he's been given. So, yeah, great keeps for the Roosters. I really like the signing of for the Cowboys as well. Jake Clifford, timely. Again, coming when Chad Townsend got dropped, plays really well last week. Chad Townsend's leaving, so there's a spot for next year. He playing at contract time, spot on, gets it right. And congratulations to all of them. Sammy Valame, he's another one. Yeah, great for them. Losing Valentine Holmes, and maybe a spot for him to challenge in, in the outside backs. So yeah, all good signings. For sure. Um, so those are all concrete, obviously. But the next thing we'll talk about is a bit of uh, the rumour mill. I like a bit of the rumour mill, so I thought I'd bring it to the show today. Uh, Aaron Clark is reportedly going to overwrite his last year of his deal at the Titans to go on the free market. And apparently he's got an NRL destination in mind. The rumours are that it's the Warriors... Would you guys be happy to see Aaron Clark come over to the Warriors? Well, so everything starts, eh, from his rumours, uh, you know. <laughs> and if you run with it and the longer they run around, the, the more it becomes concrete. And I think um, 
I think he'd fit into the Warriors. I think when you look at a, a player, and I think if you're losing Jazz, I think he's quite similar to what Jazz brings as well. A uh, different body shape. Um, obviously, uh, got really good leg speed of where the game's going. Has gotten better this year through the Titans. I think he had an injury last year, an injury at the back end. And uh, you're really seeing the value that he can add to a Ford pack. Um, so I think Aaron Clark, on the back of his mum, I think she's signed with the, the Stars, stars Nepal. Mm -hmm. So that may be why the rumours come about, is that if his mum's coming back, he may be following her. And um, I think it would be good for the Warriors. I think he's played one game, 2000 and I don't know, 17 maybe, a while ago, or even, I think, you know, 13, sorry, 20s, the 20s competition, was that way back then, Willie? Oh, that, that, that's dinosaur days for me. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so he's played one one game. Uh, he came through those 20 systems as well, so I'm sure someone will correct me on here if I got it wrong. Hey, our fans normally hold us accountable, which is nice, I like that. Um, so, yeah, I think a great signing. He would be, he would add a little bit of um, uh, different, a defensive mindset when you're trying to tackle someone. If you've got your, you got your Jane Fisher Harris, your, your Mitch Barnett, your Demetric Sefer Coolers, and you've got this little small nugget that's just hard to handle, and that's how the way he plays. So I like the signing if it was to come true. Yeah, I think it would be a good signing. He started off as a hooker at the Gold Coast, and you know they've brought a couple of players and a couple of hookers have established themselves, like Sam Verrills, have gone up there and taken that spot and made it their own. And he's moved into the middle pack, been a really strong middle forward for them and powerful, um, growing as a as a middle forward in the NRL level. And if he was to come over to the Warriors, I think what it does is it adds some strength to the rumours of Dylan Walker moving on, you know, because mm -hmm. they're going to have to make way somehow. They have got the young fellas coming through. They can't keep everybody. Cap-wise, they've got Fish coming back already. What happens to Dylan Walker is... The makeshift middle, or and as I understand it, too, who's going around again next year. So there's a lot of stocks, especially with those young fellas that Blair is mm. talking about to come through. For him to come in, I dare say someone's going to have to move. Who Who is it? But as you said, um, it's a rumour. It's a rumour at this stage. But as we've learnt throughout the course of the season, is uh, where there's smoke, there's fire, you know. So the, the rumours have been pretty spot on. Was what we've got in our mail this year. And he's kind of a different profile from a lot of the Warriors players who are either very <coughs> young coming through the reserve grades or, you know, on the older side, like Tohu, like um, Dylan Walker's getting a bit older. He's only 26. I thought he was way older based on how he looks. He looks like he's <laughs> pushing 40, but he's only 26. You're so chucking I mean. out compliments this morning, aren't you? <laughs> out no offence, Aaron. Like, you'd smash me, but, like, still... <laughs> Wow, we're uh, going to get him in here, bro. We're going to get him in here one day. <laughs> uh, moving on to the next bit of news. Ron Coote was named as the 14th Immortal. Uh, obviously, yeah, yeah a round of applause for him. How good. You guys would know a bit more about a him than me uh, as we've established my history of rugby league isn't too good so if you guys want to well it's getting better bro <laughs> um, I, I, let's, let's be, I, I'm let's let's be. i going to be real honest I don't know too much about Ron Coote but when you hear someone like Cameron Smith speak about him and what he represented and um, he spoke about his dad that was his favourite player growing up and when the question was asked him on the night who do you think becomes the 14th immortal uh, the first name that came to Cam Smith's name besides obviously himself was Ron Coote and lo and behold Ron Coote gets the 14th immortal who that anyone is anyone that's even nominated it's it's an honour uh, but to be able to become an immortal for someone that's done so much for the game and and again some of those criteria about you have you've had to change the game in some sort of way on and off the field you've had to play uh, what did he play nine was it Grand finals, nine yeah. grand finals, nine like you know what I mean. So he's he's well deserving of this this status. And um, Willie, did you end up watching? <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, I didn't. I didn't ever saw him play, but he was someone that my dad spoke about too. He came through an era um, that my dad really loved, and my dad's favourite player was Reggie Gaznia. Um, but there was Johnny Raper in that era, and they they said Johnny Raper got in the first lot of. Immortals at the expense of Ronnie Coote. So it was only a matter of time, I thought, for him, and I'm glad he's got in now because he was part of that South Sydney team that had so much success. And their failure to make Graham finals coincided with him going to the Roosters on a big money deal, which was huge back then. So there was back then it was all about loyalty. So for him to go to the Roosters showed how good he was 
and or grand finals and origins or, or playing for New South Wales and playing internationals. He was a tough, tough fella. I've seen some footage of him. Just a tough, big, athletic man um, for the Roosters. As he joins his old South Sydney teammate Bob McCarthy as an immortal. So. Yeah, great to see. Great to see. I love it when those old guys are recognised for their feats and we re- we get to reminisce and remember what they've done for our game. So good on Ron Coop for making it in. But uh, the whole discourse <coughs> of uh, yeah. the Immortals ever since it came up that there was going to be announced another one a couple of months ago, there's all this chatter from you know everywhere about what it means to be an Immortal and how you get there. So I thought I'd just read off some of the criteria of becoming an immortal. Yeah. And just just quickly before you, we had a, one of our, our fans of the show, Footy Hacks, Elijah Taylor, write into us and ask what the criteria was. And I'm sure you would have done your research and here it is right now. <laughs> so according to the NRL, the only actual eligibility criteria for becoming an immortal is that you have to be a member of the Hall of Fame already. Yep. So to be part of the Hall of Fame for a player, individuals whom have competed in the elite premiership rugby league competition in Australia and achieved outstanding feats on and off the field throughout a professional playing career. So to me, obviously, us being New Zealanders, a lot of uh, talk is always, can a New Zealander make it into the Hall of Fame, into being an immortal? There's nothing there that says that a Kiwi can't make it all the way. So what do you guys think of that? Yeah, I think it's only rightly so. Anybody that plays, Sam Burgess got inducted last week into the Hall of Fame. Now, he's eligible for it because of his service and his contributions to the game through the NRL. So anybody that's played in the Australian Rugby League competition, rightly so. But it's about your service and it's about your contribution. It's about some of your feats that you've achieved whilst you're playing. I think that's the important thing to remember. Yeah, so that's why, I, and I and I said, um, you know, shout out to all our people that were on our live this morning at nine fifteen. I spoke about someone for the future, uh, and when you look at the criteria, I spoke about James Fisher Harris, and yes, he's still got a long way to go, but you know, he played in what could be his fifth grand final. Uh, he's pl- he's won three grand finals already. Could be going to win four if he was to win four. I even think three's mean enough. So he goes on to play in another grand final. If he was to win mean, that's four grand finals consecutively. And also plays 300 games for a New Zealander. That uh, There is no one else. I think Jesse Bromage is quite right up there as well. So I think between those two guys, if there's anyone that's going to be named in there soon or in the future, those two guys have done so much for the game of what they've done through their careers on the field in an Australian rugby league competition that they could be our New Zealanders that'll get into the Hall of Fame. Who gets the immortal status? Well, that's not up to us to choose. And I think the people that choose it are, I think they're media. I think it's the media. Yeah. I've seen um, Buzz. Is Buzz? Buzz Rothfield. Buzz Rothfield, I think he's one. And I think there was a bit of a blow up over in Aussie um, with Mel Meninga, Andrew Johns, wanting to say uh, or have an opinion or have a say in who gets this or who gets nominated because I saw Mel Meninga talking about, you know, there's no bigger accolade to be nominated by your peers than than in the game. So to be nominated by a peer that's played in the game of rugby league, that understands the game of rugby league, that put his heart soul and sweat all on the field, there's no bigger accolade for someone like Andrew Johns or Mal Meninga to say, hey, this is who we think. So um, it may be an opportunity for those guys in the future to be part of that selecting list because I think it would be so much more important. It, it holds more, in our terms, mana to it as well. Yeah, and you got to, if that's the case, you've got to have players from different eras that yes. remember and understand Correct. You know, mm-hmm. when those players and the true achievements that they reached uh, – for the younger guys today, like I'm saying, I didn't see Ron Coote play. But if there's an immortal still around that did play, mm. they could give that true player's perspective. Yeah, I think immortals should be able to be able to put people in the Hall of Fame because of what they stand for and what they've done in the game. So yep. hopefully in the future those guys get a say because, you know, like I said, it holds a lot of weight coming from someone like those boys in whatever era that was. You heard it here first. Adam Blair and Willie Poaching into the NRL Hall of Fame. We're lobbying for it. <laughs> no, no, we didn't say that, my bro. We I didn't say it. that. I'm saying it. Come on, uh, Andrew Johns and all you guys in Australia. The boys want it secretly. They're just humble. <laughs> 
Uh, on we move to the games for the weekend. Just then. before we start, just, for a minute, just while we're talking about Immortals and Hall of Fame, can I just say a big shout out? We had the Auckland Rugby League uh, presentations on the weekend, and as part of the presentations to all the clubs and their achievements this year, um, shout out to all the winners and those players that made the teams of the year. Uh, they inducted some legends into the Auckland Rugby League Hall of Fame on the weekend. Uh, people like Brian McLennan and his Me. father, Mike, um, father-son duo that went in there. Bill and Dave Sorensen, um, Gary Prome, uh, Shane Cooper, Kiwi legends, Hugh McGahn. Yo. He got inducted. But a big shout out to Kurt and Dane Sorensen who were immortalised wow. um, for the Auckland Rugby League and for their achievements playing for the Kiwis and playing in Auckland, playing, coming through at Mount Wellington. Um, all Auckland boys, all Auckland fellas that made up a great Kiwi side. Um, a lot of those guys that got inducted, they were part of that 1977 team for Auckland that beat Australia, Great Britain and France in three weeks, within three weeks. Mm. And Bill Sorensen, um, who got inducted, he was the coach of that side. So great to see those guys achieve that recognition and, and get inducted into the Hall of Fame. So just before we moved on, while we're talking about Immortals, awesome. I thought it was important shout to, to the boys. shout out. Awesome. Um, and now we go to <coughs> the first game of the weekend was the Tigers versus the Sea Eagles at Leichhardt Oval. And the Tigers went back to back, baby. It's game time for them with the wooden spoon on the line. A couple games left and they're getting it done. Uh, triple Sinbin for the Sea Eagles as yeah. well. What did you guys think of that? Yeah, what a game for the Tigers. Um, you know, it's in this competition, so many teams are under pressure, not only to, to perform well and win games, but to to put themselves where they sit on the ladder. Um, this game for the Tigers, obviously battling that wooden spoon. Manly Seagulls holding their spot in the eight, just even though that they lost. So you would have thought on the back of watching the Seagulls play the Warriors the previous week that they would have been good enough to beat the Tigers. I didn't think they performed as well as they should have. Um, you know, without Tom Trevojevic, they don't get himself in their game. And yes, the three Sinbins don't help in their game. Unfortunately, it's not, you know, for, for this time in this, ga this game, the Tigers were able to keep their people on the field and play some, some decent footy. I think, you know, we've spoken about Lockie Galvin and what he's been able to create. I like what he does when he shifts the ball. Um, he's... He's a direct runner, he's involved. And then on the back of Upi Corusel, who does all the work through the middle of the park and then allows those guys to run their shape out wide. And these young kids, and I guess everyone's speaking about them now and what Benji's been able to create is, over the last few weeks, they've created a bit of consistency around the individual performance. I think nothing goes without this, without saying is Aiden Cesar has helped a lot of those young boys in their spot with his kicking game and putting them into the right positions. The Fainu brothers, Three of them, the three of them get out there this this week. Um, yep. they, they're, they're quality young kids. Um, and, and we've always known this year that they're going to have some young kids. It's going to be a bit of a tough grind. Um, luckily, that they've come out this other end. I think they're going to be better for it. Again, defence is always going to be the Tigers' problem. If they can work over the off season, they're going to put themselves in better positions. But another great win at Leichhardt uh, in front of all their home fans. Uh, Benji Marshall's pumped. You know, Uppy was a big part of that and another great win. Yeah, the thing I liked about them, they showed some composure. Even in the face of being 16-0 down and Manly having all the running at the start of the game, it was that man again, Api Kurosawa, that scored the first try mm -hmm. that started to stem the flow that Manly had. But they played really controlled. Their issue has been, and we've spoken about this all year, discipline. Mm -hmm. Almost every other week they've had somebody simbin, which has hurt them massively. This time the shoe was on the other foot. Manly get three Sinbin. They've got two. They've got questions to answer on the back of those indiscretions, which which I'll get to in a second. But the Tigers, fantastic. These young fellas, you're talking about the Fainu brothers, Lockie Galvin, you know, another young fella that they've got in there. Just going to be great for the future, great for their side going forward. And they're shown they're taking a lot of learnings out of the course of this year and some of the hard times mm. and coming out to put two, two back to back. They've got a nice buy this week. They can just go for it in the last, last weekend, game, yeah. in the last game, and chase it. All the pressure's on power now for the wooden spoon. These guys, you know, they're chasing it. They're in, they're in the box seat to, to finish second to last rather than at the bottom. So well done to Benji. Well done to the Tigers and all the Tigers faithful for, for sticking with them. Manly, um, as I'm saying, they can't afford, and no team can afford any suspensions at this time of season, mm. especially if you're looking at the top eight. 
If you're a team in the eight, you do not want any suspensions because that could dearly hurt you or injuries. Injuries could be season ending at this time of the year with two weeks to go. So, yeah, the teams like Manly got to keep squeaky clean. They've got to try and stay healthy if they want to do anything in the playoffs. Well, you speak about um, no suspensions. Corey Waddell <coughs> is the one out of the three charged for the mm. Seagulls that has received a two to three match ban. So he could be back for finals if accepting the two match ban. That's kind of a weird one, though, the reason he got banned because from me watching it live, it was, I thought it was Paseca yeah, all the Tanella, way doing yeah. the, the heavy too. damage there, yep. but he's got off with just a fine grade one careless high tackle to Waddell's grade two. What did you guys think of that incident? Yeah, I, exactly what you said. I thought Tanella Paseca was the one that contacted the head, but at the same time, they both hit something. Uh, and again, it's the fish head that we're talking about on what we see is what, you know, as fans, what we think is right doesn't necessarily um, coincide with the refs or the video refs say so. And like, like Willie said, it's this time of the year, you want your best players on the field, field consistently because it's the most important part of the, the part of the season is you've got two more games to go and you want to be able to be hit the ground running. You know, someone like Tom Trojovic who has been, you know, since he's come back from his return, he played one game in the centre, has put him to full back. He's been a different player. Uh, you've seen him take that carry when he scored that try on the fifth. He does this consistently. Picked out the fullback, ran straight over the top of him, bumped off someone else that was standing there and scores a nice try to bring him back in the game. So they, well, he's going well. They're lucky that he's on the field playing the way he is. And if you lose anyone this time of the year, you're going to find yourself struggling when it comes to these bigger games. Yeah, you talk about them coming back. And they had, moment, they had a moment there to win the game. They had an opportunity to attack and come up with an error that, Tigers go down the other end and then Samuel Fine who ends up getting the last try with seconds left to, yeah. to close it off for the Tigers. So Manly were there or thereabouts, but the Tigers just too good. As I said, they were really composed throughout this game, which shows to me they've learnt and grown a lot. And speaking of them learning and growing, um, Aiden Caesar picked up a shoulder mm. injury. I mean, they only have one game left after this week's bye, so he may well just be done for the season. That will give that last game uh, one more chance for Latu Fainu and Lockie Galvin to run the show for yeah. the whole game. It's against the Eels. How do you guys see that game going with what they've learned over these past two weeks? Yeah, well, if he's if he's not well to run that last game, then you'd play those two guys because they are the future. Um, although you'd, I think they might be in a, a good position because they've got the bye. So I don't know if they lose are they a chance of getting spoon you know what i mean so uh, depending like you don't want to get the spoon but so if if he's not good to run then you, you're putting in your your hearts or experimenting on what you've got for for next year along with obviously jerome luai who comes in as well so i think the kids can get it done like they've they are playing some exciting football and it's the last game so you treat it as your grand final it's the last time you play together as a team it's the last hit out for the season you want to go out with a bang because you know if you lose that last game she's a long off season before you get back to trying to fa trying to train again and then rectify what you did last year so go out on a bang it could come down to this last game yeah we talk about how important your spine is right and to your side but even more so how good Upper Kurosawa has been, especially when he's got those two young halves that you're talking about. But then they've got young Mason mm -hmm. coming at fullback, who's mm. outstanding. For, for them to get around the park and be in the right spots, that comes down to the, the experience and the nous and the quality of Upper Kurosawa and how good he is as their leader. But he's just another one, young Mason. We're talking about Jai Gray and Trey Fuller, some of the young fullbacks and Sharp. Fletcher Sharp as well. So the game and fullback stocks are outstanding. He was good. The little white headgear running around. Mm. It was dangerous. It's like Joe Gray. They, <clears> they, <throat> they look like quite similar players yeah, the yeah. way they play. But I guess this is where this, this new fullback models come in. And they, these smaller guys that are just tough and competitors Can and he? just go for it. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and quite fast. He's yep. got a nice try there as well. Uh, you spread it from from on the right-hand side. He scores and he slides over, scores their try. So they're fast. They're tough. The competitors, they go after it, which is pretty cool to see. Just to answer your question before about if the Tigers still can get the wooden spoon. So they're currently tied on points, yep. 16 apiece for the Eels and the Tigers. Obviously, Tigers will go up to 18 points, meaning that Eels the Eels have to win against... Who are they playing again? Dragons. The Dragons. Yep. 
that will make them level on points again. Eels have the points differential by about okay. 60, which means basically if they're down. still tied, the Tigers have to win that last yeah. game. It, like, it makes for some great rugby league the last couple of weeks, I think. You know, when you talk about the Dragons, like, like obviously there was teams riding them to lose and wanting the Sharks to win this one because it gives opportunities for 12 uh, 11, 10, 9 to try and sneak in there. But they had all in the next two weeks, those guys all play each other, so they're going to knock each other out at some point. So, um, you know, what a game that is. What a cracker of rugby league we have over the next two weeks leading into the finals. And we'll get into it a, a bit later. But, man, the Rabbitohs are pretty lucky to not find themselves in the wooden spoon uh, race themselves. But we'll move on to the next game. Uh, Warriors versus Bulldogs at Sean Johnson Stadium, 34-18 to the Bulldogs. They ruined the party. Um, yeah, it was it was tough for the Warriors fans that got to go watch the last game for the boys. Sean, Adam, and Jazz all playing their last game at home. Not the result they would have wanted. Yeah, a great night, you know, besides obviously the loss for the Warriors. Um, you know, celebrating, you know, one, I guess, a legend of the game that's retiring and also... You know, Jazz and Adam Fanua Blake, who have, um, you know, carried the club well over the last few years. Jazz, obviously, his whole career, hundred and I think 136 games for the club. Adam, the last few years, I think 2021, he comes in. So he's been a big part of that club and their journey, especially on the back of last year's performances. If not, still is one of the best front rowers in the competition. Um, and Jazz just has just competed every time he puts on their jersey. And, you know, I thought that was Jazz's best game uh, for the Warriors this year. He started, he had the opportunity to start, and you could see that he wanted to try and get this win, not only for, obviously, Sean, but for himself, putting in a good performance. And, you know, between the three of them, I thought they had a great game. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Warriors just weren't good enough. Um, Sean Johnson, you know, walks out in his, in his farewell game to the fans, obviously a little bit... Um, you know, having a bit of a moment to himself and then gets out there and I think his first touch, he drops the ball, uh, which was cool. That's wiped out, get that out of his system and then he plays on and he was trying to wind the clock back there a little bit with his sidestepping and his flick passes and, you know, they go out to a 12-0 lead uh, and I think when you when you think of the dogs, obviously Matt Burton had his 100 milestone as well. I guess they know when you come into New Zealand and in these occasions that it's, they're going to start real fast. They just didn't manage to hang on there. I think the first part of the first half was all Warriors. The back half of the first half was all the dogs, and the dogs just kicked on from there. I think, you know, we've always said on here uh, that the dogs play a great style of a brand of rugby league. Didn't start really well because they, I think they were down 20, it might have been 25% possession, knock ons. The weather was horrible. It was wet, it was cold. Um, but once they got there, their systems and structures in place, they went on to kick on and, and win their game. Crichton was a beast with and without the ball. <laughs> <laughs> and um, <laughs> along with Burton and, and, and the rest of those boys, I thought they, were, they played a quality game, just tough, hung tight, worked it out in the end and got into what they needed to do to get the job done. And, you know, this is what the good teams are doing these days. I think they were five straight wins uh, now. So it's, it's hard in this competition to get two in a row or three consecutive, they've got five, and doing it at the right time of the year. So a massive, um, you know, win for the Dogs. Yeah, they're much improved, aren't they, the Dogs, from where they were at the start of the year. But the Warriors, they rode the occasion. As you said, it was a big, big night, big, big night for three gentlemen that have been great contributors to the club and to the game here, and the fans turned out in force. Just unfortunate that the weather came down in buckets and it had affected the game. It affected um, how it was played. It turned it into a game where you had to run <coughs> rather than try and pass your way out. And the passing, <coughs> excuse me, uh, got the got the dogs into trouble. Toby Sexton came up with some uncharacteristic errors to start the game. Warriors moving the ball. I thought the try to Kirk Caper was outstanding. Hit a mm. beautiful hole, rounded the fullback under the post. But then... Uh, Disappointment for the Warriors. They conceded a try in almost identical fashion to what they did last week. Last week, Manly turned a play underneath for Tommy Talao to come on a cross play, trying to get to Sean and Britton Nakura, and um, sorry, Murata Nakura, and they make a break through kick out, set mm. up, and they score. That's, you know, two weeks in a row, it's almost the same identical play, and so they didn't really quite fix up an issue that they had before. So to repeat that 
is a is a worry to repeat that as a concern for them. But then they go in at half time eighteen sixteen in the lead, look like, yeah, we're gonna turn it around, but dogs just switched it on. Burton stepped up, Crichton stepped up, and they just had too much for the Warriors and unfortunately they're full of confidence and the Warriors you could see the tough times were still there, you know, there's some demons there for them. The tough season weighing on them, couldn't quite get it done for those guys that are leaving, but on a night that the fans will still remember, mm. they're still appreciative for the service that those three guys, and especially Sean, have given to them for a long, long time. Um, they go away with, you know, some great memories still, but the Warriors got one more game before they have the bye in the last round, and hopefully they can get a win and send those guys off in the right way. Um, before we talk about their game next week, the Warriors, I think we have to talk about more in depth in, about the uh, Stephen Crichton tackle oh. just because, man, every yeah. time I go on my phone, I'm scrolling and I, every two scrolls I'm onto another thing about people blowing up about it. So what are your guys' thoughts on what happened there? I think no one would have uh, argued that it, it should have been 10 minutes. Uh, both um, the, the NRL people and fans and both clubs wouldn't have said anything if it was if it was 10 minutes in the bin um this new interpretation of force in the contact has only come out round 25 like it's it's not really where you want to be bringing in these new interpretations and mitigating factors never heard that this year so when you talk about those things um you know if someone's slipping down you swing an arm you knock him out is that a mitigating factor that he slipped so you only, just because he slipped and you hit him in the head, does that mean it's only, you know, a penalty? Like, for me, and where they've got to this year is most, you know, you see penalties of just soft, like, I guess, for example, Rogers in, uh, up in, up in uh, Suncorp against the Dolphins, he wraps his arm around his neck, they give him a penalty. If you compare that to the Crichton shot, and you get you see how Roger ended up after the contact. If you're telling me that's a mitigating factor that you haven't hit him with enough force, then I'm watching a different game. Like that should have been ten minutes. And Willie's must probably got a different opinion. But my opinion is that I think he should have been in the in the bin for ten minutes. I think at the time the game was still quite tight in the balance. And I'm not saying the Warriors would have won this game, but it does it does help if you've got one of the best players. I think at centre in the game of rugby league, sitting in the sitting on the sidelines, both defence and attack, sitting on the sidelines for 10 minutes, it does actually help the opposition. Whether they make the most of that opportunity, that's up to them to try and work out. But I think it really didn't help the situation for the Warriors where Roger goes off, they don't get him back. They already lost a, a centre on the other side, Adam Pompey. This has been their year. They've had back rowers filling in in the centre positions. They haven't been able to cover those positions because not normally those guys get injured. But to lose a player for high contact to a hit in the head where the rules and the game has always been pretty hard on and then bringing a new interpretation of mitigating factors, I think it's too late to be starting those interpretations. So for me, it should have been 10 minutes. Happy with that. Come back on and then finish the rest of the game. What fans want, what coaches want, what players want is consistency when implementing rules. And the way the game is going, regardless of whether I agree with it as, as, a, as a dinosaur or not, <laughs> that's how it is. Mm. Any contact with the head has been punished. We saw that so many times throughout the course of this week. What I don't like is so many sim binnings. I think that's hard because... What we're talking about the Tigers and how they've been simbined so often this year, that's hurt them and res results wise. That's turned games for them that they've been in so close. We've seen it before. They get a, a simbining in the last 20 minutes of the game, the game blows out. That hurts for the fan. But I also understand safety for players. I also understand player safety has got to be paramount when we're implementing these rules. So the way they're going, is there any contact with the head? You go, you go for 10 minutes. I don't get, in our game, with the size of our players, moderate force. Yeah. I don't get that. There is no moderate force. We play a full contact sport. We have a full contact sport where our players, we're asking them to go run 100 mile an hour into each other 
There's no water at force. Well, no one goes in there half half pace. No. You're like, no one goes into contact half pace because you'll come off second best. That's right. So there is no such thing as moderate force. You go in there to try and tackle someone, and if you get it wrong, you get it wrong. And we've spoke about this all the time, about maybe lowering your contact. But this is from centres jamming on fullbacks. But it's the same thing as if you're going to tackle some big fella running at you or, or a back five who now bring the ball back just as hard, you've got to hit him under the yeah. ball. Like, that's just, this is how it is. And back to what we're talking about with Crichton, my argument in the immediate was he stepped in and it looked like Roger hit his arm. But if Ron, if Stephen Crichton moves to his right and keeps space, because he had nowhere to go left, he, he was into his next defender. If he goes right, Roger goes through. So he was never going to go anywhere. But regardless, he made contact with the head. And at that moment in time, it needed to be 10 minutes looking at everything going, that went on in the weekend. And as a NRL have done, they've dropped the referee from the bunker because of the decision he's made. And I think that says everything about what we're trying to do. Any contact with the head, regardless of how it goes, we're in that position now. And if that decides the grand final, then so be it. We've, got a, we've made our bed, we've got a line. Mm. Well, you've seen over the weekend, the rest of the games, Willie, really, is anything that touched near the face was a, was a penalty. Whether it was a slight touch or anything, even if it slipped up from their shoulders and went up to the head, they were given those penalties on nearly yellow cards. So, again, it's, it's a reaction thing sometimes as well, and some people get it wrong. The, obviously, in this instance, the, the video refs got it wrong. Like, it's, it's, a ple- it's quite clear for everyone to see. I don't know how people get it wrong, but, again, the rules are you can't touch anyone in the, in, in the face, whether it's moderate contact or force, it's still contact to the head and long of the days where you could do that because when I was playing, that was play on. If someone was slipping, it's okay. Now, you can't touch it. Those are the rules. So, you know, it's just, it's hard when you're, and I see the frustration in Andrew Webster, obviously the frustration of the year, but also the frustration around um, the consistency of what the refs are looking for. How do they not pick up these things? So, um, after the game, it was hard to like, listen in to Coach Webster's conversation because obviously he was disappointed in the result, disappointed in their season, happy for the occasion for Sean, but then the result, or oh, then some of those calls or officiating. And this is the first time I reckon I've heard him talk about the refs. And he didn't say it in, in the way that he was pointing the finger at the refs, he just was talking about the inconsistency around some of the calls. So he doesn't normally say too much about coach or, you know, talks too much about these other factors that are, are uncontrollables, but this is the first time I've seen it because I think the occasion was bigger than what happened. On a more wholesome note, how was it being in that haka for Sean? Yeah, so cool. I think, um, you know, as Kiwis, as in our culture, as a Māori person, it's a sign of respect for someone that's, um, you know, as a legend of the game. For, for any milestones, I think it's important for our people and our players who are of Māori or Kiwi heritage or even Pacific boys to go up there and show our respects to those players. I think I saw the Titans do something for Cam Fraun on home soil. Um, and a lot of the times you get opposition jumping in as well. And, you know, I got a little farewell send-off back in my time when I finished up and I, play, I think I played against Manly and a few of the Manly boys jumped in there. And it's, it's pretty cool, I think. Um, when you stand back and you take it all in and you watch from afar, you appreciate the support that you have in the game. Um, but you also appreciate what you've done in the game to be able to create these friendships, to be able to showcase your talent. And a sign of respect for all the players is to just farewell them with, you know, a respectful haka. And yeah, we do that all, all around New Zealand for every occasion, whether it's a wedding, a birthday, you know, any milestones on the game of rugby league. And it's showcased around the world, this. Um, so it's cool. And this is our culture, this is our people. So I, I like, this is what we do. And for the last one on this game, going into next week for each of these teams, uh, for the Bulldogs, they're playing the Seagulls. They'll be without Crichton uh, due to his ban that he's received. And Kurt Mann fractured his clavicle. He'll Ooh. be gone for the season. He won't play even during any no of the way. finals. Uh, and then for the Warriors, I mean, you couldn't have written it better. They're playing the Sharks. Uh, Sean Johnson's old team, other yep. team. For his last game and Adam Fanua Blake's team that he's going to. Wow, we. That's their last game of the season. Who who bloody wrote that, mate? You're a genius. <laughs> uh, but they'll be without uh, RTS, who got mm. the concussion, obviously, and Adam Pompey with his knee injury. Uh, is anything going to change on the ladder with those games? Do you think the Bulldogs push into the top four? 
And that's a big loss uh, for the Bulldogs. I think he's he um, he's part of their middle service, and I think this is where the game's gone. Eh? Um, the middle service player becomes really important. Kurt Mann's been, I think he's been enormous. I think he's helped out a lot of that, the movement around the middle of the park through their forwards and then their connection to those halves. So I reckon they'll lose him. They've got the kid on the, the bench that comes on and plays for him as well. Forget his name all the time. Bailey Hayward. Bailey Hayward. I said, I think I said the same thing last week. <laughs> Surely I would have got it right this week, eh? So I think, you know, um, between Kurt Mann and Bailey Hayward, they are the link to the middle of the park. They've got some really good skill. They are the new style of locks. Um, so they may not miss him in that thing, but I think he, like, as you get into the, the finals, someone of his experience and knowledge, um, I think he could help as well. But, yeah, no, when you know, we talk about writing scripts, those three guys... Um, you know, they still got a little bit of a farewell to go. Sean, I don't know if he gets through this week at training. Maybe he might not roll out next week. He had his farewell party at um, <laughs> go meet old Sean Johnson Stadium. That might be it for him. But Adam Fanua Blake, point to proof, I think. You know, finish off on a high for the Warriors and show the club what he's going to get. I think we all know what Adam Fanua Blake brings to, to any side and he's only going to strengthen that Sharks team. But, you know, there's three players there that want to go out on a high and also, obviously, the Sharks want to keep continuing to stay where they are in this competition. Yeah, no, I don't think the Warriors hold back. I think they go for it. As I said, they didn't quite get to do it at home. They'll want to send them those three out and everyone out on the best way possible and finish the season on a winning note. What, what, I, what I would like, Willie, is for um, the NRL and Coach Webster to push back some of those players so they can play New South Wales Cup. Um, so so all those fans that have been supporting the Warriors, there's also the pathways as well. And is the, that all right last week? And the New South Wales Cup, hey, they're sitting in a nice position right now. So they'll be playing finals football. They're sitting in fourth position. At the moment, they've got the Jets above them on 33. I think there's a lot of us all on 33 points. Top five? Top five. So we're not going to drop to four. We can go as high as one. Um, so... I'd love for uh, Coach Webster to send some of those players back. We'd love to have Dimitri Sefakula. Uh, we will get him. We will get him, but maybe not this week. Uh, Luke Metcalf. We'll take Luke Metcalf too. Um, but, hey, if you're not supporting the Warriors after this weekend, there is the New South Wales Cup boys, and, man, they've been killing it this year. Do you still have a bye on the same week as the Warriors? No bye. No, no bye. Oh. So one more week to go Bring for... the whole team down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One more week to go for the New South Wales Cup boys. Uh, they play the Jets this weekend, who are one in front of them. Um, the Canberra Raiders are top. Uh, the North Sydney Bears are second. They're all, everyone's on 33 points, I think. Or they're on 34, the two top teams, and then the two under them on 33. So any loss or any win could shoot the Warriors. We're going for a win, boys, here, and we're trying to get the top spot. And if you get the top spot, you get the week off. They had a big one against the Dogs to push them down. Huge, Both dogs were in fifth. And huge win. Now, I think the Dogs now. might have fallen to seventh or sixth after that. So, you know, a bit of pressure on that competition. But, yeah, you, can, you, you only qualify to play New South Wales Cup if you've played, I think, five or six games in New South Wales Cup. So you can't have everyone come back down. So... <laughs> I think there's a dispensation for Luke Metcalf because he was out for half the season. Lukey, brother, you need to play, my man. <laughs> Love you, brother. Hey, the only thing I heard there was that the Raiders were winning, so come on, the Raiders. Uh, that's my team. On to the next game of NRL. <laughs> bro, whenever you talk honestly, bro, I'm just like, what's he going to say next? This was an exciting one. Broncos versus Eels at Suncorp, 30-24 to the Broncos. And according to Kevin Walters, uh, Bloody hell, they are definitely going to play finals football. They're still out of the eight at the moment, but they've done the job here against the Eels, the second worst team, <laughs> to yeah. put themselves on that path. Well, the Sharks done a favour to a lot of these teams. That's why he's still half a chance. Um, but it will come down to the next two weeks for all those teams below the, the Dragons. What was it, 16-0 at half time to the Eels or 18-0 at half time to the Eels? Um and I thought it was it was all over for the Broncos until the last 20 minutes, I think. And I think, you know, Adam Reynolds will take some ownership for his first part of that, that game until the last 20 where he just got back into what he does really well, kicks nice and strong, follows his kicks, supports, and, and put them in a, in a bit in a fighting, gave them a fighting chance to come home strong. Um, wasn't the best game from, from the Broncos. Um, and Kevy Walters wasn't happy after the game, and neither was Adam Reynolds. Um, and again, like our game's made up of moments and a bit of momentum, and sometimes they just didn't capitalise on some of the momentum that they, they created, and then these moments they just would want to have time back again. Some great tries in there scored by the Broncos. 
And the Eels, like we've seen the last three weeks, is they can play some footy. It's, just, it's whether they can play the consistent footy for the 80 minutes. And for both teams, that's what it comes down to in the end is one team came home strong for the last part of that 80-minute 80, that, that 80 game and, and got home and got the win. And um, like Kevy said, they, they're a fighting chance. I don't know if they're definite into the eight, but I think they're a fighting chance of playing, playing finals football. But they've got some key players out of that position, uh, out of that team. And so those key players are big moment players. And if you don't have those in the back end, I don't know who they look for. I think they're, trying to, they're relying on Sailor a lot to try and break something open at fullback. He's not a Reese Walsh. Um, but he, there were some great moments from him. Uh, he looked good in the back of the plays. I think he got a nice little break there and, and then snuck down the side there and good support from everyone else. But other than that, like I find it hard for them to be able to be pushing for that eighth position, for sure. As Blairy's saying, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. And they did. They found the finishing touches to get the win in this one. But the difference for me in being on and being slightly off is huge at the NRL level. And when they were on, they were scintillating the Parramatta Eels. They were finding the pass. Mm -hmm. And when Penasini goes and scores, the, the positioning of the pass and the timing of the skill was outstanding. But one pass that's not quite quite on the money and Michael Sivo has to reach back, he misses a try to extend it out to about a 22-0 lead. Now, and that, that ended up costing them so the difference between being on and slightly off with your skill and your, your execution cost you. That try would have definitely, mm. I think, put away the Broncos yeah. at that point in time. But the Broncos come out, up steps, as you said, Adam Reynolds, Tristan Saylor, an outstanding individual try to get around the fullback and score, and the Broncos just come home with a wet sail. Um, we're talking about tackles and lowering. Uh, your, tackle, your tackle height... Um, an example of that was, and I think coaches and players will work hard over the course of this mm. preseason to lower their target level rather than to go high anymore, was Piakura. Yeah. Piakura does hit him late, but because he's hit him low, he doesn't get any, mm. any time off the field. And there's no argument. There's no argument about it. All because he's, he's lowered his target height. He's naturally, he's got a, he's got a, good naturally a great low tackler anyway. Yeah. But that's an example to everybody else on how to go. You, know, you may be late on some occasions, but where we've got to go now as a game is do what he's doing and get low. But back to the Broncos, yeah, they've given themselves a shout and it's interesting to see Kimmy Walters in the press conference. You know, the, the journalists ask him, you know, if you make it. No if, mate. No if, we're making it. We're making it. So there's no doubt they're sharing on Parramatta this week because yeah. they've got all eyes on, on the Dragons. They lead that pack of four. Mm. In ninth position, they've got themselves back. But I hope, I just hope that if they don't have to look back and regret the losses against the Gold Coast, the two losses, and resting those Origin players when they played the Warriors, Warriors when they had the chance to play them. But he chose to, to rest them because that could really hurt him and be the difference with them, between them being in the eight or not. Well, everyone else is on minus below them and they're on <coughs> positive two. Positive two. Um, so yeah, they'll be relying on Parramatta to ups to put an upset on the Dragons, and I think they can. I think the Parramatta Seagulls can upset the Dragons again. Like yeah, we've spoken on here about the Dragons and how inconsistent they have been. There's some days where they're on, and there's just some days that they're just off. But they haven't found what it is that it looks like consistently to work out how to win every single week. And there's some great individuals in their team, uh, but as a, as a group, they just yeah. We'll get to them later, but they got a bit of a hiding too. And something you said, who do you think is the biggest loss out of Ezra Mam, Payne Haas and Reese Walsh for the Broncos? Oh, I think the threat is, is Reese Walsh. I think the threat is Reese Walsh. I think they've got some really good, strong carriers of the ball through the middle. Obviously, Paddy Carrigan leads all of that. As long as he's out there through the middle of the park, I think they can actually work that out. But I think the threat at the back of block plays just your standard, you know, front door, back door, is is Reese Walsh, just with his speed. He can get on the outside of a half and get to a centre real quick and have a nice good lead line inside the, outside the centre just because of his pace. Um, has he played his best football year this year? No, I don't think so. But he's a big game player. He's a big game player. And if they get there without having 
him in the team, I don't know if they'd be able to kick on after week one. You know what I mean? So I just find that, you know, he's the threat. I, I, I like Ezra Mam, I love Payne Haas, but I think Reese Walsh is the threat when it comes to, you know, big game experience. Do you think the same? Yeah, I think Reese Walsh. I think he, he's got a bit more X factor yeah. and big moments mm. come around him. The, the young fellow that played six took a great individual yep. try. Um, his name escapes me now. Uh, Josh Rogers. I Josh think. Rogers. Um, he scored a try very similar to what Ezra Mann would do. He yep. steps off the left foot, runs through. But I think as a halves combination, Josh Reynolds can run him and organise him. Adam. And he, uh, Adam Reynolds. And you're talking about the middles carrying the load. Yeah. You know, He's a great player, and they're missing Payne Haas, no doubt, but they can carry that yeah. load. The X factor for me yeah. is Reese yeah. Reese Walsh. Yeah, and you said I think Adam Reynolds can get him around the park with Paddy Carrigan through the middle of the park trying to organise his middles to get them where they need to get to, and then Adam Reynolds doing his stuff. The young six will get his job done. Reese Walsh, X factor, so yeah, they, they, they will miss him when it comes to these big games, if they make it into the eight. Well, speak of X-Factor, uh, Selwyn Cobbo was back. 11 it's tackle great, great to see him back. Holy hecka, bro. I really want to see him play fullback without Reese Walsh there at the moment because I just reckon the more that guy can run with the ball, he might get 100 tackle breaks if he gets 100 carries, you know? Yeah, he's, he's man, he's a, um, he's a good player. He's a good player. I don't think his fitness allows him to be able to play consistently at the fullback, and, and it's a tough job. Uh, they are the most should be the fittest players on the field because they are everywhere and they've got to carry the ball back. They've got to be in position to be able to attack. So at the minute, maybe it's something for the future. And if he wants to be a fullback and he comes out and says that, there could be clubs looking for someone like him because I don't. I think he'll do a good job, get some more Ks under his belt, um, learn it a lot better, you know, get fitter. And I think he could make you know fullback his own. I just don't think he gets it at the, at, at the Broncos because of Reese Walsh. But mm -hmm. it's great to see him back on there because man, he is a strong carrier of the ball, um, fast, you know. And when every time he carries, he's hard to handle. So you know, it's good to see him back on the field. That's for sure. Yeah, definitely. You have got to be so fit now to play fullback, attacking wise, being on the sweet plays and finding yourself in the right position. And defensively, you've got to own that mm. goal line area and get yourself across there. We've seen so many times when fullbacks aren't in positions, when you see kickers put a little grubber kick in, the first thing I look for is where the fullback is. They've got to be around the play, they've got to be around the ball. Whether that's five metres, 10 metres, 25 metres away, you've got to get there. There's no doubt he's got the pace. Mm. You've got to work on your energy systems and your, <laughs> your energy levels and your fitness to be able to do that time and time again at fullback because it's totally different to playing centre or wing. It was that one run where he caught the kick and then ran the arc from his wing all the way to the other wing and broke about four tackles, went to halfway. That Man, that was what got me thinking that. But we'll move on to the next game, which, <laughs> bro, this game. Raiders versus Panthers at GIO Stadium. 22-18 to the Raiders. Up the Raiders. <laughs> Come on, the Raiders. Bro, he's going to ruin our show, bro. Straight up. Like, honestly, for all those people that are watching it. I'm a day and, like, one Raiders fan, always have been. Can we just apologize? Well, I apologize right now for you people that have to listen to our mate. Honestly, bro, that is way off. Uh, but anyways, he keep going. Yeah, anyways, have uh, your moment. <laughs> Elliot, have your Elliot moment. Whitehead's uh, last game at home for the club uh, surpassed Ricky Stewart's 203 matches over his nine year stint there. Had a bit of a cry at the yeah, end. He was a bit so upset, did I. Wasn't he? I was crying as well, just at home on watching my TV. But yeah, they got it done over the Panthers, giving them their second straight loss. Yeah, it was a, an upset. Um, uh, but when I think about it, um, like. This is what the Raiders can deliver, but haven't been able to deliver it consistently this year, eh? And the Panthers are down with a lot of players out. Um, you know, obviously Nathan Cleary's their biggest threat when it comes to, you know, getting them around the park. But although they don't have him in the team, they've been able to get the job done without him this year and they've been consistent. And I guess that's what gives them so much more belief uh, that no matter if he's not around, that they can get a job done. Luai is, is good at what he does. They were just very lucky at the end there, that intercept from Matt Tomoko, that took the game away from them. So the game was in the balance. They were attacking the line. They were winning. They were winning. You know what I mean? And that just that one opportunity or that one moment, if you were to go back, do you pass that pass again or do you choose a better option? Most probably. But 
you got to play the play, and that's what happens. He, he chucks that cutout pass. Was that Luai that chucked the Luai, cutout yeah. pass? Mm. Straight to Matt Tamuko, and I thought Matty Tamuko could have ran the length, but gave it to Xavier Savage, who I thought was a beast. <laughs> everything he touched, uh, everything he did, his tries he scored, um, he was com- he was competing. And, and that's probably, you know, for me, the best game I've seen him play this year. Um, up against a, a quality side and some great outside backs that the, the Penrith Panthers have. So, you know, you've got to give credit to the Raiders, um, you know, in a bit of an up-and-down season. They're still in the hunt, aren't they? They're still in the hunt? No, Raiders gone. They're still they, on 26. Still yeah, so they're, one of, the 26. so they're one of those teams. So, you know what I mean? Like, I think if you get a Raiders team in the eight and they can put in, like, they've got some forwards in there and they've got some, some strike power through their team, they could challenge some of those teams as well. Whether they get to a final, I don't think they will, but they would, you know, put people on notice and put a team on notice if they were to get in there. But Elliot Whitehead, obviously nine years. Jeez, I didn't know it was that long that he's been at the, at the club for, but he's been a, a great servant for that club. He's put his body on the line. Uh, Ricky Short obviously loves him and what he brings. One of, uh, you know, some of the better um, Englishmen that have come over into the game and stayed in there alongside, obviously, you know, Sammy Burgess, James Graham, uh, that has consistently... I stayed in the NRL and actually performed really well. Has he gone back to the UK now? Going back to Catalan? Going back to Catalan. Oh, Where he came from? Wherever they get their money from, I don't know. But <laughs> can I have some, please? <laughs> I'll come. <laughs> no, they don't want to wash up, dude. But, you know, go to give Chani a ring. Yeah, Chani, yeah. Oh, bro, Chani. Chani, watch this show too. We'll tag him in this. Alex Chan, bro. We'll get us over there, both Willie and I. Um, but the Raiders, yeah, what a nice win for the Raiders, which then knocks. Obviously, the Penrith Panthers down to the fourth position. Um, obviously, on the back of some of those other wins, the Sharks and the Roosters. Mate, this this uh, competition is heating up. A couple of surprises in the weekend, but this was my biggest surprise. The Raiders, especially how their form has been at home. They're so inconsistent. Did not pick this coming. Um, granted, uh, the Panthers had a couple of tries. This allowed one to mm. Dane Laurie in the corner when it just... Out of touch when it could have been a try, but they still had a shot. They still had a shot at winning it late on, as Blairy said, had it not been for the intercept to Matt Tamoko. But completing at 90%, the Raiders had to be at their best. Mm. They've got to be at their best when they're playing these teams, and this is what they were. They pounced on the moments when the Raiders, when the Panthers opened the door slightly, they took them, they took those moments to really punish them. I thought James Fisher Harris was very, very good mm-hmm. again. Oh. Scored a great try. Was yeah, really, really strong. Good support play from a front row. It's nice to see. Yeah. It's nice to see middles pushing Sniffing up around up the, the middle. Okay, showed some pace from twenty out. Of, yep. I'll say thirty out. Fish. <laughs> <laughs> he, you know, took his try really, really well. And we've seen Moses Leal to score some of those oh. as well. So both of them have that ability. They'll still be dangerous when they get to the playoffs. Yep. And, you know, they'll get Cleary back, but they're uh, just fine tuning. They came up with uh, a lot more offloads the Panthers, than what you normally see. They played a lot more football than what you see about them. But, yeah, if that's something to come, that may be something they're working on and just quietly to open up the game a little and play a little bit differently. But, yeah, congratulations to the Raiders. And Elliot Whitehead, he was a great kid always coming through. He's a, he's a Bradford lad. Grew up you know, playing for a club called West Bowling, coming through. And, um, everyone I spoke to about him, he, they spoke to him, and especially the people that worked with him as well, were a little bit like Ali Lautiti, just mm. naturally strong as a kid. Even though he was 17, 18, he was always tall and big, but naturally, without even trying, could manhandle people and physically, and that was a real strength of his, but he's, he's grown into a fantastic football and a great servant to the NRL over the nine years. And he came from, he signed for the, Dragon, for the Raiders from Catalan. He's going back there to finish his career, but... I reckon he'll go back and live in Canberra when he's done, such as you know, the high wow. esteem that he has. And he's he settled there. He loves it there. So um, it was interesting to see Ricky Ricky Stewart's comments about him and spoke a lot about the character of the fella that when he comes back for old boys' days, you just look for the crowd of people and that'll be Elliot because everybody gravitates to him. Everybody mm. loves him, such as a good fella that he is. Um, for the Panthers, I feel like... We don't usually see Ivan Cleary go out and make statements uh, to rack up his team in public, but he's made that statement uh, that just to the media that uh, they are not playing good enough and he is not happy with how they've been performing for basically 
a while now. Yeah. And obviously, two losses on the trot. They've knocked themselves down to fourth place, taken the agency out of their own hands for uh, the top four race. What do you think? Are, are, they, are they still what we know them to be, the Panthers? Well, the thing is they haven't played the type of football for the last month. I think when Cleary come back his two games, I think he wins the game on his own. You know, that, that drop kick... And then the Redcliffe game as well. Like when he was, when he come back, he won those games uh, for for the Panthers. So when he th- talks about you know not being their best, I think he's spot on. Sometimes for coaches, if you put it out there, you, you're trying to get a reaction from your team, and whether it's more so that they go, oh hold on a minute, you look within and go, yep, we're not actually playing well, but making sure that everyone understands that as well and. They they say that you don't, you know, people say they don't listen to the media or read the papers or see it, but players subconsciously, or if not, look at these things and understand, and they would be having a deep look at themselves, and they know that they're much probably better than what they're performing, um, but I think he's just making sure that they get a reminder that, that hey, if you want to be the best team on grand final day, you have to be better than what they're showing right now, and um, their standard is right up through the roof. Like, that's why... They have been the best team the last three, four years. They've played grand finals the last four years, going for, like, this, this is their fifth grand final. So when you have a standard and you don't meet those standards, with, whether it be just under there, <coughs> then someone's got to let them know so they actually look in within and work it all out so that they can get ready. So, you know, it's not, I don't think it's danger, danger time for those guys. I think they get it when it comes to big games and things can change real quickly in the game of rugby league. We've seen that over the year. So, you know, you bite the bullet, you work hard, you double down on your, your structures and your systems and your standards and you come out the following week and rectify that all and then things, the noise goes away again. There's no questioning their ability or their capability. You know, when you go against the, the Panthers, you know you've got to be on. And f- as far as them chasing a fourth title in a row and, f- and going to a fifth grand final in a row, there's no need for motivation for them as far as departing players. Fisher's leaving, Luai's leaving, um, Taruva's leaving. So there's some motivation to do it for each other and do it as as the group. My question will be, is the hunger there? In, the, in those moments when the game gets tough, you know, and the game is tight, are you hungry enough to keep doing it? Can you fall back on what, what's got you the last three? Is it there? Do you know, are you really hungry for for number four as you were for one, two and three. Mm-hmm. Now, because the other teams are, the other mm-hmm. teams are hungry. Melbourne's hungry. Are they as hungry? That's going to be the question that needs to be answered and will be answered through the playoffs. Well, you know, you know, for me, the Melbourne Storm have gone under the radar to sit at top of the ladder and win the minor premiership. I don't think that really, you come into this year, no one's talking about the Melbourne Storm. Everyone's talking about the Penrith Panthers and how they can go for the four peak. And I'm guessing they're thinking that as well. But what what they would understand is that every game that they play is a tough game uh, because you are now the hunted, and teams turn up matter no matter where you're coming on the ta- on the table, whether you're last or, or the top, teams are coming for the best team in the competition, and the best team are the Penrith Panthers because of their history and where they've been able what they've been able to create over the last four years. So for me, the the Storm have gone undetected, sat under the radar, and if you look at their squad over the year, have not had their best players on the field. It's only been the last maybe two weeks that they've had their best players on the field. And then all of a sudden, boom, they've got minor premierships wrapped up with two weeks to go. And the Penrith Panthers, everyone's talking about their little slip and their fall off it, no Nathan Cleary. It's because teams are turning up to perform and play their best footy against them. And, you know, so, so, the Storm just keep doing what they do and no one's talking about them and... I don't think anyone will still talk about them because the, the Panthers are the team that everyone wants to beat and the Panthers are the, the grand finalists from last year. So the pressure's on them. It's on no one else but the Penrith Panthers. But I think this is why they live for it. This is why they play the game. And I guess, like you said, every time they've played a grand final, they've played for someone that's leaving the club. They've lost so many good players over their time that I think same thing again. They'll do exactly the same to try and get them home and try and get the win and send these boys off the way they want to go. But they'll find it pretty hard, I think. Well, no one may be talking about the Storm, but we yeah, are, I know. we'll move on to the next game, the Storm versus the Dolphins. And, oh, my God, they absolutely destroyed them. And I'll tell you what, give Jerome Hughes the Dallium right now, <laughs> if only for the Mully. 
come on, man. That was <laughs> <laughs> that was a mana play right there. That was <laughs> love it, eh? Love it. <laughs> How many meters did he run with his pants down? Fifteen. Yeah, fifteen oh, meters. Didn't even didn't even stop once to no. pull his pants up. No. That's just too mouldy, eh? That's it. That's that straight kite cut of France. <laughs> I'm mouldy, bro, and just keep going. You know what I mean? Like and flick it back. Yeah, and flick it back. And this is why the Storm are doing what they're doing, eh? Um, class all over the field that game. Um, the Dolphins. Just, didn't even, just weren't even in the game because the Storm didn't allow them to play any football. Um, they've got strike over there. Herbie Farm has obviously been really good for them. You know, Cody and Isaiah Katoa, but I just don't think they allowed them to play the style of football that the that the Dolphins normally try and play, spread the ball to the edges, try and move them around. Um, the Storm suffocated them defensively and then the attack just went after them. You know, I'm enjoying Jack Howarth on the edge. Um, yeah, at the start of the year, and there's always been big reps on. I think he's only 21. From big rugby convert. Um, didn't really get into the starting team through injuries, has found himself in the centre. He is a back rower, um, but he's been real consistent. He's strong, he's a big body, he's athletic, uh, can score some tries as well. And then obviously I like my little mate so far along. I just love what he does. He's just a ball of energy. Um, you know, when he gets his chance at the ball, he finds, you know, finds one on ones. He's got that many goose steps in his in his repertoire. It looks like he's just doing it in the air and not goosing anyone. But I just love what he does. He looks like he's having a little fun with it. And obviously on the back of Jerome Hughes, who we've spoken about, and then Harry Grant doing what he does. I thought Harry Grant was enormous for the Storm as well. Uh, and, and that backed that up was obviously Jerome and, and Cameron Munster. And Pepinau's like this is I think what second game that they've all been together like at the back end of this year like they've all had time on the sidelines and I feel like and I think we said last week where they're going to rest people I just you can't rest that spine because they haven't had enough game time together and now that they're building some consistency up um, it's great to see them playing some football and then obviously the big occasion big Nelson um, 200 games for the club um, Man, there's some, some big name players that have played over 200 games for that club and alongside obviously there's Jesse Bromwich and Kenny, uh, those boys have been a big part of it. There was a big moment for all those ex-Storm players as well and Big Nass come out the last month, I think it's been his best football, he's looking fit, he's looking strong. He's laughing over there because he mostly wants to take him to Samoa. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can see Willie smirking in the corner of my eye when I look at him and I'm thinking, hold on a minute, I should not pump this guy up. Nah, he hasn't been playing that well, Nelson. <laughs> but we'll still pick him. Um, but he was he was a beast. Um, you know, that try, yeah, and these are the hard things for people to tackle this guy. Like that close to the line, I don't know where you tackle him, but he just picked someone out and just ran straight over the top of him, scored a nice try, and he was pumped for it. So what an occasion for the Melbourne Storm to wrap up the minor premiership two weeks out from the competition being finished. Um, it's a credit to that club and what they've been able to create over the years. What is it, over two decades now, those guys are just consistently playing you know, finals football, and if you're any player looking to learn the game of rugby league or want to get down to a good place, culture, system, structures, it's get down there and learn your craft because these guys will teach you. And, you know, on the back of obviously this performance and pre our conversation at the start of the Hall of Famers, you know, Billy Slater, Cam Smith, Cooper Cronk had that many had that much praise and only spoke about Craig Bellamy. And without Craig Bellamy, they said that they would not be the players they are today. And you ask anyone down in that club, and myself included, like you don't learn what you do without someone like him and how he's been able to, you know, turn you into the player that you have or had that career that you've had without having Craig Bellamy alongside you on that journey. So, yeah, massive win for them. Minor premierships, unlucky for the Dolphins. They're fighting for that position. I'll come back to Craig Bellamy, but um, such was their dominance in this game. 61% of the ball and completing at 82%. They never gave the opposition mm. any hope. They ran for a 1,000 more metres than the Dolphins. And how are they ever going to compete against a side that's flying like Melbourne are when they're running and playing with those numbers? And that's that's what allows Jerome Hughes to do what he does. Mm. That's what allowed um, Harry Grant to get out and duck out early in the game and really threaten around the middle of the park and be as dangerous as he was. Um, the whole Melbourne Storm performance was quality. There was a late one from Sewell when he just drops the ball on the high kick, but mm. that was uh, the only blemish, really, that they had as a side. They were just quality across the park. And the golf between them at this moment in time and the rest of the competition is daylight. Just what they're doing and how they're playing. And 
the Dolphins are a team that are fighting to get into the eight. Mm. So it's not like they're a team whose season is over yet. They've got plenty to play for. It was all on the line for them. But so ruthless are the storm and their approach and the mentality that Coach Craig Pellamy instills in them that they just go out and do their job. We're spoken week after week. Just how disciplined they are and how they understand the system and the culture that they work within. Um, my question is, with Craig Bellamy, we've spoken about Cameron Serraldo as the coach of the year. And for what Melbourne have done and how dominant they've been with the side that they're rolling out, mm. Jack Howarth, nobody knew him. Nobody knew Sean Bloor, really, at the start of the season. He's had to move um, Tyron Wishart all around the park. He's been without Cam Munster for most of the year. He had periods where Harry Grant was out. The start of the season was without Pappenhausen. Mm. I'm just starting to lean towards he must be a shout for Coach of the Year for what he's done with the side that he's had and how dominant they are. Well, you've, they've, they've cleaned up the competition and won the minor premiership for two weeks to go. Um, but I, I think, like, I, I can completely agree with what you said, but I think where the momentum is... <laughs> It's with the Bulldogs, yeah, and that's where everyone's focus is right now on how have they been able to do this over the last 18 months. But you're correct, when it comes to the Melbourne Storm, with all those players that they've had out, and everyone that they've lost over the, over the years, whoever thought that they would still be where they are, playing finals football consistently over the two decades that he's been there. Like, it's, it's unbelievable how he can have these players like Jack Howarth like Wishart, you know what I mean? Like Farlong or where they come from, I don't know where, like Sean Bloor, and still be able to win games, you know? It's crazy what that club can do, and I guess it comes back down to the culture of that place, but also, I guess, the people around that help get these guys up consistently every single week. Um, and I get it, like, they all know their job, and, and literally when I was down there, that's all you had to worry about is get your job done. You don't have to worry about what he's doing. You just do your job and everything kind of falls into place. So, yeah, I think he, I think they both go close to it. I think that, you know, between him and Craig Bellamy, it would be a flick of a toss of a coin. Yeah. Like, you could toss the coin up and say, you know, and give them both the coaching of the year, you know what I mean? Like, I'm sure they can. So, yeah, it's, it's crazy to see that these guys are, are still sitting at the top of the ladder with everything that's gone on this year and still have and might have won the minor premiership with two weeks ago. It's crazy. Yeah, regardless, both coaches done remarkably well with the yep. squads that they've had and for the turnaround of the dogs that uh, Cameron Serraldo has been able to finally fulfil. Mm. But, yeah, I just thinking over the weekend, geez, that side's mate, been through a lot and what they're doing and how dominant they are picking up that minor premiership. Geez, he's done a great job, Craig Bellamy. You still think... Again, do you still think Melbourne Penrith Grand Final? Clary coming back, yeah. Yeah. If he doesn't come back, I think it's a different story. Yeah. I think it's a different story. Because they may end up playing. I think it could each, be Melbourne Dogs. That, well, guess. Well, guess what? They may be playing each other week one of the finals. Penrith one and, oh, and, and and Storm, and this would be an interesting. And this could be an interesting game. Uh, if they knock them out, they. The Penrith, whoever gets knocked out, has to go the long way around to coming back. Right now, uh, for me, I'm saying, like, and I've said Penrith, like, without Cleary, I don't, you know, I'm just trying to think, if without Cleary, they may not get to where they need to get to or be strong enough. But if you look at the Roosters' performances and where they're going, um, you look at their team on paper, they are an NRL Premiership team. They could be the Storm and, and Roosters in the GF, maybe. Two big, strong clubs. Well, the Roosters are a strong club, but Storm just getting getting done, getting it done. Could Man. be interesting. Anyway, we're just chucking it out there. Man, <laughs> keeping it keeping it in the family of the last, like, how many? Yeah. Eight, eight premiers. Well, it, it, it's <laughs> the most consistent teams or clubs over the last 10 or, you know, yeah. 10 or so years. Um, they are the best teams in the competition. Um, you know, Sharks are still sitting in there. But those three teams, the Roosters, you know, Penrith and Storm, are the most consistent when it comes to big game, big game um, matches. Just back on this game, 
uh, Warriors fans, if you thought that the bunker only botched it when it came to oh. high tackles, I tell you they definitely don't because oh my goodness, that saw far long or try where he just planted it on the dead ball line and they called it a try. That's how good saw is. He gets away with that. Things. Yeah, that, that try. Um, was it on the line? On the dead ball line. I'm sure. Yeah. So is he the guy upstairs lost his job again? Um, oh, well, we'll, sure. You'll know Annesley will come out today and, and clear up all these things anyway from the NRL and say, yeah, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't a try. But it's pretty clear, eh? There's a little bit of white, white in there. But I think it was the motion of rolling it back, maybe. Because when he flicks it back yes. up, the, gra- the white grass, like Stuck. some of it comes up <laughs> and falls off the ball as it's going back with us. Uh, yeah, anyways. That, that wouldn't have changed the results. Nah, yeah, that's probably what makes it a bit <laughs> yeah, more forgivable. Yeah. But. And the, the, well, that's the, you could say the same thing about the Warriors versus the Dogs is that it wasn't going to change anything. So, oh, what does it matter? You know, keep them on the field. It doesn't change the result. But in the fans' eyes and in the coaches' eyes, it does. It, it plays in effect because yeah. you lost your best player. So, yeah, got to get that right because come grand finals or finals games, you wouldn't want that try to be the difference in a, in, in a big game. Um, Jesse Bromwich got the HIA in his 337th game, obviously playing against his old team, yep. hopping into the top 10 of appearance makers of all time. Oh, good. So well done to him. They also lost Cody Nikarima to an HIA, so they'll be in trouble next week against the Broncos, which is their season gone. If Did they lose. get um, Category 1s? I believe so. If they got Category 1s, they're both, so. they're both out for the week. Yeah. I believe so. Both out for the week, because that's what happened to Roger. Category 1, he's done for the season. Um, so unfortunately, yeah, when the when the games are on the line, especially someone like I guess Cody, who's been a big part of where they've gone this year, the Dolphins, like it's going to be tough, going to be tough, and then obviously losing a leader of Jesse Bromwich, so this could be it for the Dolphins this weekend. And then the last one for this game, which I just found funny, the stat. Uh, the Storm had eight different players take at least one kick. So Hughes, Grant, Pappenhausen, you'd expect, and Munster, you'd expect taking kicks. Wishart took a kick, Farlonga took a kick. <laughs> King, Josh King and uh, Eli Katoa all took kicks in this game. And Josh King's kick was a forced dropout as well. Yeah, he's actually done a couple of kicks this year, (laughs) old Josh King. And actually, you know, the the good thing about Josh King is when he's kicked, he's chased his kicks, eh? And and you don't just stand there and admire your kick. (laughs) So he's chased it down and got it back. But yeah, there's a lot of different players kicking balls in that game. So uh, You ever do any in-play kicks? Nah, because I didn't like, you know, when, when, when say if it's a last tackle, everyone expects you to kick a ball. So why would you do what everyone expects you to do? Try and like run the ball and get an offload or, you know, draw and pass or find the space or look up because if you're on one side of the field, everyone's kind of working towards where you're going to be. And if you see space the other side, why wouldn't you just chuck the ball? I never did any infield kicks. I should have, though. Drop goals. You reckon you'd have it in you? Like, you're just down I think the if there's one side. thing that I would have loved to been able to um, do as a back row and the one, most of the only little tool that I didn't have was like a little, little kick in me. Um... Because you do run, like, you, you pretty much, I think that adds a little bit to the back row as well because you can become an option off, off, like, off a play or down a short side, you know what I mean? So yeah. if there's one thing that I would have <laughs> loved to be been able to do while I was a player was to learn how to, or actually, no, not learn, be more confident in my ability and skill to be able to put in or practice doing little grubbers through the line off Ooh. being a back rower. I so. Remember. Found yeah, would have benched you yeah I know. I don't think I was allowed to offload the ball till I had played at least 50 games for the Storm. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and back in the day, they said, you know, Storm play a boring game of football. You know, it didn't matter for him. It was you win by one, you win by 10. It doesn't really matter. It's, it's really night and day when it comes to those guys. So um, I was never allowed to offload a ball till I played about 50 or 60 games. So it was a real up the middle, grind, boring football, win by one point, take the wins, take the L's, get to the grand finals, win those ones, um, which was, I was very lucky. But again, most probably one thing, like I said, is if I could have learned or had confidence in practice kicking a boy as a back row, I think it would add a little bit more to, to my game as well. <laughs> <laughs> moving on, moving on to... <laughs> Moving on to the next game, Rabbitohs versus Knights out of Core Stadium, 36-16 to the Knights. Caelan Ponga and Dane Gagai put on a show Beast. against them, and the man, Seb Sua, made his debut, which I will get into in a bit, but how do you <laughs> we, feel about the game? Yeah, it was, um, 
again, a team that's playing for something and still being a chance of playing in the eight. Uh, those guys you spoke about, Gagai and Ponga, were pretty much, you know, the difference. Ponga with his speed and his skill on those long shifts, Gagai with just being mouldy. Um, you know, using his feet, being strong, being hard to handle, and then finding Fletcher Sharp, who is building a nice little resume into his, his short career at the moment. Good kid, can play some footy, can score some tries as well. So I think between those 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 three guys, um, you know, they were were pretty good against a Rabbitohs off the back of Jack White and trying his hardest. I thought, you know, we, we've always said his best position is that sixth position, and I thought he played really well. In those positions this year, he's tried hard. He's got sharp left foot. He's he's, he's strong. He's powerful. He's a good runner. He's a runner of the ball. Um, so I think you know he tried his butt out, but unfortunately, you know for for them, the Knights are playing for a little bit more, and um, you know outclassed them in the end of the class of um, Kalen Ponga. But again, I just want to talk about the halves. I think it's the sixth combination this year. Koga and who was the other one? Crossland. Crossland. Finish Crossland. I think he's been a, a surprise package for me. And then the halves, he's been their nine. I thought he was one of their better nines last year as well on their run, their 10 mm -hmm. consecutive wins. I think it was close to getting a Kiwis call up, but I think he had an injury. Um, there's one position in the, the New Zealand space is, is you know, kidding? finding quality hookers and even halves to, to that extent as we grow through our pathways as well, and especially through yeah. the Warriors stuff. So there's always been a bit of a lack of um, hookers and, and halves here in New Zealand. So he was, yeah, he is a Kiwi, so he's got a chance that he could play for the Kiwis. Right, I thought he's the most Aussie looking. Yeah, why well, he a little Newcastle surfer. He looks like just a little <laughs> little surfer, surfer boy from Newcastle. But I think, again, they're, they're two new halves. I think Cogger was really good, took the line on. Um, and I think every time they can actually challenge the line, those two, it always opens up the space for Kalen Pongare, and I think they did that really well. But the sixth combination, you know, when you're going into this these big critical games, they need to be on those guys. And luckily, you know, they got this win, but they played against the Rabbitohs that are sitting down. Where are they coming? 15th? Yeah, yeah. it's third from bottom. 15th. Almost in the and, um, game race. I wouldn't say they're not playing for anything, but, you know, the, the Knights had more to play for. Yeah, and they made every moment count that they were afforded because they didn't have the most of the ball. Uh, South Sydney had 54% of possession and squandered a lot of it. Um, as Larry said, Jack White tried his best. He tried to take a lead and threaten the, def the defensive line, which opened some opportunities, especially when Tane Milne scored his try, showed some strength. But the Knights... Um, they found a lot of chinks in the defensive armour of the of the Rabbitohs. I thought defensively, they were way off. I, I think they missed 51 tackles in the yeah. game, yeah. which you know is going to hurt every, anybody. And Kalen Ponga's got to expose you. You, you. you come up with those numbers against someone of his quality. That time when he made the break up the middle of the field, there was a really fragmented defensive line. It was broken. There was holes straight through the middle. And Kalen... With all his experience, split him open. He got a made a break down the right hand side and, and passed it back inside for another try. But Cogger, there's a real fight at the Knights mm. with I think four or five different halves. I think Tyson um, Tyson Gamble's injured at the mm. moment, but there's some others there. They've got some uh, work to do to try and find that settled combination for next year up in Newcastle. But great for them to get the win, and they needed to get that. They've, they're the other team that we're talking about with. The Dolphins and the Raiders and the Broncos all on 26. The Knights are still within a shout, mm. within a whisker of, of making the eight at this moment in time. We'll, we'll see how the other games go and how their last two performances are. But they're, they're still in there. They're still punching away. Dan Gagai, fantastic. I love him. I love mm. that kid, the way he plays. When he plays direct and plays strong, he's such a good centre. Got to play against his brother as well. Yeah, for their first um, time playing against each yeah, other. Yeah, that's their first time playing against each other. I um, Quick story, uh, obviously Māori's. Um, I got both, I selected both him and his brother for the whole purpose of, you know, an opportunity to play alongside your brother. Never know when you're ever going to get an opportunity and it may be still down the track for him as well to be able to play alongside his brother. And this is what the space can do. It gives these kind of opportunities. Um, unfortunately, his brother was going to debut and I think he's 27, I think he is. So uh, a bit of an older player. So the dream is never over till it's over. 
Um, so he got told that I selected him in the All Stars team to come along and join his brother, which was pretty cool and special. He was so over the moon and pumped and rapped, both of them were, and, and it was a nice moment for those two boys. And then getting told from his club that um, he's going to make his debut for the Rabbitohs, which I said, bro, like, he was conflicted. He wanted to play for the All-Stars because of his brother and he thought it was a great opportunity to represent his family. But at the same time, this opportunity that you've, you've built up all your life to try and play NRL, to get his debut game in Vegas, I thought it was such a, um, a great moment for him and his whanau. And I know that both brothers were excited for this opportunity. So yeah, a great little matchup, being able to you know take the field together and play against each other, hopefully in the future. And in that All-Stars game, we get them playing alongside each other and that'll kind of tie it all in together and bring it all back down to earth. Was there a clash of, of things? Is that what, could he not play? Well, you don't want to get injured, eh? Oh. And I guess this is the big thing with the NRL clubs in this All-Stars game is if he's going to get an opportunity to debut, like, you know, you weigh up the, the pros and cons and whatever you think is the most, um, you know, the most important thing for you now. And for me, for him, understanding from a player's perspective, like, that is... The number one dream 27, is... 27, That's sure. your number one dream, bro. Like, if you wanted to play in RL and you get an opportunity at 27 and the club says they're going to debut you on the wing, like, that other dream can come back around again. You know, there'll be an opportunity for them to play each, with each other. So, yeah. man, what an opportunity this was for both brothers to play against each other. It would have been tough. They were on the opposite sides, though, eh? No, they were on the same, same sides. Side. The same oh, that's side. why he was carving them up. Yeah. <laughs> sad, eh? Hey, sad, yeah, bro. Yeah, that's going to go down sad. well at the oh, family Oh, mate, lunch. there would have been some conversations at home <laughs> of that one, eh? Hey. <laughs> bro, you all good? <laughs> you speak of debuts, and I brought it up before. Seb Sua yep. uh, got called in uh, because of the, I think, the double uh, 18th man activation. Yep. Uh, obviously, we know him from yep. uh, something that we've worked on in the past. Uh, he's uh, We followed him. Yep. from uh, Mount Albert, yeah, local was playing stuff, club, yep. moved over to Newcastle, was uh, in their juniors there, yeah, and now to making his NRL debut in a two-year span, pretty good on the young guy. But then Sinbin's Sinbin. immediately in his first game. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah, it's um, like he's a big boy, uh, and he's obviously yeah, learned a fair bit in the two years, and obviously a prospect for them. They see some potential in Zeb. And, and Seb and what he can do. Uh, unfortunately, it wasn't much really the way he wanted to play his first game or even come off, come onto the field. You know, you're 18th man, not thinking you're going to get an opportunity. Don't know if he would have had his whanau there to support him on that one as well. And you're just hoping that um, you go out there and do the boys proud and then put in the performance you're proud of. And then I seen him, he got penalised. <laughs> and I'm thinking, he's standing there going, hey, I thought he was having a talk. And I think the ref said, oh, you've got to go off. I think he didn't know what, he was, <laughs> what he'd done wrong, eh? And he wanted to stay on the field. But, um, yeah, massive congratulations to the bro. I think, um, you know, it's only up for him. Yeah, the ref said... No, I'm not joking. You gotta yeah, go. Yeah, off. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's funny. You talk about Jacob Gagai at 27, but anybody, had, and I learned this as an older player. Once I got older, it was awesome playing with younger fellas and seeing them debut, and seeing what they went through and how they prepared and what they sacrificed to get there. And it's awesome to see young Sua go through his. Am I correct in hearing that his he's got a famous father? Ah, uh, yeah, Murphy. Murphy. Sua. Yeah, I heard that last night. Famous cricketer for New Zealand, yeah. yeah. He's Samoan. That's awesome. Samoan, yeah. Zeb, Samoan? Zeb, is he Samoan? Yeah, it will be. If <laughs> <laughs> so like, <laughs> look. Malo, malo. <laughs> yeah, hey, bro. Fire out. I'm just chucking them all. That's how we do. That's how we do. Chucking them all over to him now. <laughs> Fire out. Nah, we're a team, Willie. We're a team. <laughs> nah, you're right, though, Willie. But a bit of a contrast from a famous cricketer of a dad to becoming an yeah. NRL player. And a big boy, too. Yeah. Big, strong, aggressive yeah. fella. He's yeah. taller than me. Yeah, he's like, got a. Pretty tall. Yeah, he's developed really well. Um, for the Rabbitohs, Cam Murray likely Done. his last game of yep. the season yeah. unless they somehow get away with it, which I don't think is going to nah. happen. But he had an enormous game despite the Simbin. 178 metres run, 53 tackles for one miss. We had a similar Standard. game. He had a similar game last week and we yeah. spoke Standard. about yeah. how he's put his body and soul into their team. And you're talking about him looking tired and stuff because of the minutes he's playing and the amount of work he's doing for his teammates. And... You, you don't expect anything less from someone like himself. But unfortunately for him, that, that's his season done. And, you know, he's if he looks back on his season, he's going to say it was a successful individual 
you know, inv individually, I thought he was really good for them through the ups and downs of that club this year. And has had to stand up in the media to face a lot of the, the criticism, not only of the club, but some individuals as well. And um, he's, um, he's defended his pl players like a captain would and held, and you know, how does club to good stead? I think I think he's he's a humble guy, but goes out there and gets his work done. And you know, credit to what he's done this year. Uh, it's bigger and better for him again next year, hopefully with Wayne Bennett. Especially for the Blues, eh? Uh, but also for the Rabbitohs, Tyron Munro's return was a bit over overshadowed. I feel like no one was talking about it that much, considering he's only played one other game this season, which was round six, where he did his collarbone. Mm. And the last time we talked about him over a month ago, I told you guys that his injury was indefinite. He was in the same camp as um, Campbell Graham. Yeah, They were, looked like they were, you know maybe facing not playing again type of territory, but he just snuck his way yeah. back into New South Wales Cup last week and into the top side this week. 151 metres and eight tackle but bus in a loss. Pretty good for them. Though. Well, he's a, he's a kid of the future, and you've seen him when he come on the scenes and what he can deliver. I guess it's more about just making sure that his body's getting developed. He's only a young kid, got some speed, can obviously play rugby league as well. So um, got a bright future there. He's, he's a great player, just got to look after himself. Yeah, got to look after him too. I'm not sure if I would have rushed him back into first grade this mm -hmm. week on the back of such a long injury and questions being around it. But their coaches have decided to throw him in there and he handled it more than well. Hopefully he just stays fit for these last two and gets a good pre-season under his belt. Certainly he'll be wanting to play for Wayne Bennett next year, I'm sure. And then last thing on this game, uh, the Knights, <coughs> both their back rowers, uh, yeah. caught some injuries. Tyson Frizzell, obviously that's why Murray's gone for that <laughs> awful concussion that he probably has for, off of that hit. And then Caipius Paul, some kind of leg laceration, so cuts in the leg. I don't know. Got a boot. I, I think yeah, I, I boot. read this morning, got a stud. Across his leg. Across his leg and 15 centimetre gash, which they tried to uh, say looked like a shark bite. So they rushed him straight to hospital and he had surgery just to repair that and stitch that back up. And yeah, it sounds gruesome. That'll be a couple of weeks on the sideline for sure, that. Just looking at it. was it? On his thigh? It said somewhere on his leg. Somewhere on his leg, okay. Yeah, well, hopefully that one doesn't hurt too much. That sounds painful. Uh, we'll move on to a few the stitches next game. won't hurt. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of locals and uh, a few stitches. Play on. Tough guys. Oh, he's one of those yeah, yeah. tough F pommy dudes. Player. Six foot six. He's a big man. Uh, next game: Titans versus Roosters at Seabus Super Stadium. Forty-eight twenty-two to the Roosters. They took care of business, uh, but. Lofi Camprere, eh? We've still got a run. Right. He's We're leading still the scoring try scoring tries. Keep going, son. Keep going. Bro, when I saw that run off, I'm like, because he just put the toe down, run. And he was oh, just jogging, cruised. just cruising along. And then he just got in there, broke that tackle off to the Esco, runs the length. And I'm like, there it is. There's the speed. Keep going, bro. Um, yeah, again, the, the Roosters uh, are putting in some really quality performances and scoring a lot of points at the right end of the season. Um, they wouldn't be happy with the 20, the the, the 22 points, so I think they're, they're a better team defensively than what they've been able to show. I think they can attack, we all know that, uh, and they've got attacking players all over the field, you know, from, from Crichton to Tesco to, to, to everyone else through their team, you know what I mean? I think they're, they're quality players, and I said earlier, they are on paper, you know, I reckon they're the most, most probably, if not the strongest team on paper when you look over their side and what who they have on paper, but... Gave them a little bit of a touch-up, I thought. The, the Titans, they tried hard, but it was a couple of like long-distance tries that put them back in there. I think there was a drop ball, and uh, Keanu Kinney was just in the area, scores a try, picks it up, puts it down on the try line. Um, they tried hard, but again, when you come up against the quality side of the Roosters, you've got to turn up defensively first and foremost. Uh, and, but then understand that there's going to be opportunities like Crichton had. And um, he was just in the right place at the right time, Crichton. He got three tries. You've got to put yourself, you create your own luck too. Like hey, he runs block plays, they play at the back, he's just pushing through the line like you're <laughs> supposed to. And then it was just a draw and pass back to the inside. And I think the same of his, was his first try was a bounce on the ground, I think. Mm -hmm. And then he picks yep. it up and puts it down casually. I think he thought it might have been like a knock on or something. And then he's counting how many tries he scores at the end and three <laughs> tries, which is, you know, he, he's, a, he's a good player. Um, obviously in origin, he got signed to the Roosters this year again on the back of his performances and alongside Sam Walker. Um, 
who I just love, that little fella. I just love how he plays. I just love what he, what he sees when he's playing footy. He's a competitor for a little guy, defends really well. He's a strong defender and, you know, as long as they can keep him in that squad alongside some of those other guys, they're going to be a tough team to beat. Yeah, I think we've said this before. They are by far the best attacking team in the comp. There's no questioning that. 22 points that you're saying they'll be disappointed with and rightly so. And as we said at the top of the segment, uh, Luffy Carparero, our man, pick them, just keep scoring, son. Keep going, <laughs> keep racking them up. Give us one of our predictions our way. But the Roosters, um, there's no questioning their football and their set piece play. We said last week how they run their second man plays, the depth and their passes. Spoke about power when you're on, they're on pretty much every time. When they run those plays, they're on. And there's, there's been a couple of times this week where uh, the halfback or somebody's just received the ball, whether it's a, the ball's been knocked down and it's back to one. Adam Reynolds did it in the Broncos game. Mm. Just grab it, stab it through for a try. Luke Carey come up with one. In this game, usually it's Sam Walker coming up with those sort of plays. He still scored, Sam Walker, but some wonderful skill on show by the Roosters. They... I really like their play where Tedesco has scored down a short side. It was winding back the clock a bit for Trent Robinson and some of his systems to when Minicello and mm. Maloney and Pierce used to play and they used to play two halves either side and one of the one of the spine through the middle. So where he's and it was Tedesco this time just found himself on a short side, big three, took him on, scored the try. Great uh, great play by them, but we're talking about injuries at this time of year. Mm. Joseph Swalit is could be an expensive one. I don't know the, the degree of injury or severity of his injury, um, but what it did, it forced Satili Tupanua out to centre. He was outstanding. Guess, guess. That try that he scored when he ran around. His hands were fantastic anyway. Yeah. He set up with quick hands out centre play, and then when he got the chance to make a break down there, guess just Keanu, burned Kenny them. just. I don't, think, I don't think Keanu Kitty knew, thought he was going to run around him. I thought, you know, being a back row, you think, oh, he's either going to run over the top of yeah, me or, or, show him a little bit. Or, or step me back on the inside. And I think he showed him a little bit and he just took off. And he's like, holy heck, I didn't even know he had that much speed. But, you know, with those centres going down now, he obviously falls into that centre category. And obviously with Jared Wadia Hargreaves, I think, you know, could be in some strife there. Yeah, and there's another one, you know, Jared... Just coming on the back of that suspension, could be looking at some more time, unfortunately, because of his record. I reckon, his rap he, sheet, yeah. uh, I reckon he might get three to four weeks, eh? He could do. Could like do. That, 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 yeah, that hurt, well, the, that hurt hurts, them last year. Yeah, it, it hurts for the team, but it also hurts for him because this is his last time playing for the Roosters. And, um, you know, he's a big part of that forward pack. And when they, when they play the, his intimidation of the others alongside uh, the other front rowers um, and then having... The man come off Spencer, come off the bench, and, and or even starting with Jared. You know, you have Jared and Spencer starting. They are both two intimidating front rowers that go after the opposition. You lose your enforcer, and now you have to try and have someone like Spencer Lee Nudes to try and be that person. Whether you want him to be the enforcer or just get his job done, you know what I mean? It, it weighs up a bit of a problem there for the Roosters, and I just think with his carryover points and similar incidents, he may find himself sitting out for the rest of the season. It could be three to four weeks. I mean, Terrell May has had a couple games this season where he played 80 minutes of yeah. role, So, Well, we're yeah, getting so. into these big games, though, you know what I mean? And you have to get your rotation right, yep. um, you know, and you're coming up against quality opposition. Every game's like a grand final. So whether they can play the full 80, he most probably could, uh, but you've got to man-manage the rest yep. of the players in your team. Just back on Satili, because uh, his stat line looks like bloody prime James Tedesco almost. One try, 120 metres run, two line breaks, three line break assists, three try assists, two tackle breaks, one offload and 20 tackles. Bro, that guy was doing it all. And then the other thing I want to bring up, Sam Walker has cracked 200 points. He's the third player to do it this year behind Val Holmes, who obviously had the week off, and Jermaine, who obviously got destroyed, <laughs> didn't didn't have a chance to score many points. So it's now 208 for Val Holmes, 205 for Asako, and 204 for Sam Walker. The Roosters have the Raiders and then the Rabbitohs left to play. Could Sam Walker be the one that takes out the point scoring middle? He's... He's kicking well and he can score tries. He, he's at least one try a game 
And then if they're hitting these these 40 points plus or anything over 30, it's because of his kicking as well, you know what I mean? So he's definitely a chance of taking the most points for this season for any player in the competition. And, mate, for someone that um, the, the, the Roosters sent him back to reserve grade uh, to try and find a little bit, got a little few injuries in there as well, and then back on back out of there again and then back in, like he's been, I guess, persistence and hard work and then just listening and understanding what's needed of a player, but not taking away his his kill, his instinct of playing football, is which, which I admire for a kid that's just come to the game with all the pressure that we have as in structures and systems and clubs and in teams. This kid still plays what he yep. sees, and I think that's a credit to him and his, I guess, his upbringing through his family and his parents and, and what he's been able to create when he's on the field, but still being uh, able to play in a system and a structure, you know? So... And I think he may go close to getting that one if they go on to, you know, getting more big scoring. I found it quite interesting before the game that Trent Robinson steered away from any contract talk about Sam Walker. Mm -hmm. And didn't want to chat anything about Mm. whether they're going to keep him or whether he's going to take up an offer from the Broncos and some of the big money that's on offer for young Sam. And Trent Walker just straight batted and said, no, I'm not going to talk about it. What I found very interesting. They have to take him. The Roosters have to pay the money from him. And they will find the money. Um, you know, their Uncle Nick will find some money for this kid. And it's, it'll be up to him where he wants to go, I think, at the end of the day. Like, I think there's going to be clubs that will be paying over a million dollars for him. And the Roosters will be one of those. But it'll be where he sees fit and where he thinks the best opportunity is going to be for him to play grand finals. I think if you if they play a grand final this year, like... The Roosters team changes again next year. Some of those key players, you know, Swali, Jared, Joseph Manu, all leaving. Um, Luke Carey, do they still have the same team that's going to be able to compete at the end of the year? Like, you know what I mean? So these are the things that he has to weigh up. Where it suits for him and how he thinks his future looks, whether you follow the money. Um, but when you say follow the money, it's, everything's going to be over a million anyway. So he's in a very good position. That's all I'm saying. Roosters win the contract. Does he get one of those ten-year deals? Yeah, you have to lock him in. Oh, I don't know if you'll say. I don't reckon they'll give him ten. I reckon they go five. No, they did with Cherry Evans. Yeah, and... I reckon. Oh, I, I think they go five. I yep. think it's just smarter mm. to go five because you just never know. You know what I mean? Like the smartest option, but, but even five years. Well, you know, that's that's nearly that's five mil plus. You know, could even be close to six, seven million for that kid over over five years and. How he's playing right now, and if you can foresee the future, which we can't, like there's only there's more upside to him than downside. Being yep. so young in the way that he plays, he's worth all the money he gets right now. If he gets to the finals and they don't talk to him, like man, <laughs> his value goes boom through the roof, and he's all oh, he's hot property. That dude. Yeah, that uh, long long contracts thing. We've talked about it with the Seagulls. Can be a bit risky. They have yep. about six, seven, eight players that have. Like almost eight years. Yeah, yeah. And, and then that's when all these clauses come in, you know what I mean? Which is sometimes bites the clubs yeah. in the butt. If you're putting all these clauses in, like that's when, and, and it's in the favour of the players, which it, which if you're a player and you're do, doing contracts, you always want those favours in, your, in, in your, your hands, not the clubs anyway. So the battle of trying to, trying to put a five-year contract down and also having the players' clauses in there, not the clubs, is, is the, half the battle. Yep. But he deserves everything he gets right now. He's, he's a gun player. And for Joseph Suali, I think on the broadcast they said that it was just a stinger and that they were resting him just because he was in pain. So but how yeah. many fullbacks do the Samoans have now? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you can't pick any more fullbacks, <laughs> eh? Hey? Like, you can't have Suali if he's able to play due to his contract stuff with rugby. You can't have... Roger Torvasa, Sheik, you can't have far long or You might as well call the New South Wales team, bro. Just chuck everyone on the field and just put them into a position because they're good enough. <laughs> hey, Willie. So. <laughs> um, come in. <laughs> on to the last game of the weekend, the Dragons versus the Sharks at Wynn Stadium. 38-10 to the Sharks. Uh, as the Dragons have gone, it was a losing week for them going in because they won last week. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. They lost this week, uh, and the Sharks put themselves up into third over the Panthers. Yeah, um, most probably the best performance I've seen from the Sharks play this year. I thought they were their middle forwards were tough, 
they were strong, they carried hard, um, got them into the in good positions of the field. They they built momentum and off the back of the momentum, Braley was enormous. Uh, some nice execution of passes. Uh, Jesse Ramian out wide. Kyle Edel was good. Um, he had some great moments, tough moments. There was a bit of a push and shove on Lomax as well. I love it. Getting stuck in. Um, you know, not many backs do any push and shoves these days. So he got a little bit of an elbow to the back of Lomax's head and walked away like he did nothing, but got everyone in there. So I thought between, you know, those cent the two centers, um, real quality from them, them two boys, and on the back of Braley and his passing, getting them into position, um, their halves and then their front rowers built so much momentum through them and played fast. And obviously, Britain Nikura, um, man, that. And I, I hear the commentators say it every year in every game that he plays is, if not the best line running back row in the competition. Whether it's just your normal back rower line, which is not just a normal back row line, it's just a tough line that he runs at speed, or it's that drop off play back through the middle of the park. And I guess with his power and his speed and then his versatility to be able to use his feet to find uh, players that are not working hard enough, like he scores tries like that most weeks. And, um, there was a lot of standout players in there and needing it right now where they sit on the competition table and coming into the finals and the dragon oh the, the dragons like we said win one lose one win one lose one so maybe they're going for a win next week um, just can't find consistency uh, Lomax getting out there trying to do stuff Ben Hunt you know I didn't think Ben Hunt played his best game but a few areas around him as well um, the fans turned up, I guess that's the positive as well, the fans turned up on Wynn Stadium, you know, nice afternoon, fast running track, mostly suited more the Sharks and the Dragons, so unfortunately the Dragons, uh, you know, sit in that eighth position and get to stay in eighth position, but have made it a little bit harder for them and the Sharks peaking right now. Nico Hines on the loom, he's coming back, isn't he? Not too far off. I think so, I think he's a couple of weeks out. Yeah. I really liked how they looked. The, the Sharks, I thought they did everything at speed. Mm. They ran with speed. We talk about Ramian, he started the game. He looked unstoppable with his footwork and pace to get outside his opposite centre. But they played the ball quicker. They ran faster. They just did everything a lot faster than, than St George did and it blew them away, especially at the start of this game. And it shocked them, I thought. Shocked mm. St George on the back of... Winning last week, I thought they were going to be quite comfortable and get into this derby game, but no, nah, the Sharks were outstanding, moving the ball. Good to have um, Braden Trindle back, kicking best mm -hmm. um, through the middle. They were strong. We've been spoken glowingly and rightly so about their wingers when they've had Katoa and Mulitalo. They've not been there, but their centres and Kaolito has, stepped has really up. stepped up big time. Love that big Sam Stone Street. He's big, big thing. And scores a couple of tries, powerful. Rough. Yeah. Rough looking. Yeah, and you like, hear him talk after the game? No. Oh, he's from out west, so he's a bit of a West DA. <laughs> but love those rough diamonds, I reckon, yeah, yeah. in our game. You know what I mean? You chuck him on the mic, you don't even know what you're going to get from these fellas. But yeah, scored some, he was good, bro. He was he's good. Powerful thing. And got some pace too. He scored one or two from distance this year. And um, Atkinson was good again. But the Sharks, they're finding some form. I think they're going to hold on to that fourth spot the way they're playing. No, that's that's a big driving force behind them at the moment, but yeah, they've they've turned the corner well and truly to find some of that form that they started the season with. All the pressure on the on the Dragons now. They've put a a heap of pressure on them, and rightly so. They've not been consistent enough to mm. really be settled right now in that eighth spot. The Broncos are breathing down their neck, and probably the most likely out of those four because of their for and against to challenge them. And as we've spoken before about on the show. Their game against Para is big next week. They've really got to try and get a job done against Parramatta, who are going to try and put an 80-minute performance against them and try and avoid the wooden spoon. So plenty to play for still. Still some question marks about the consistency and how good the Dragons really are. Yeah, the Dragons' fate still in their own hands because of that two-point buffer. But... I have a question. So for me, I feel like this week on, week off that the Dragons do, I find it way harder to watch them. I think that I would prefer that the Broncos leapfrog them in the table and make the eighth spot because I feel like they're a much more exciting team 
to be in the finals and have that chance to maybe do a miracle run back to the final or something like that. No offense to the Dragons. I know the jersey's right here behind me. But I just feel like, for me personally, and I don't know what you guys think about this, I'd, I'd prefer that the Dragons do drop off in the last two games. Yeah, well, you, you look at the style of football they play compared to, obviously, the Sharks. And they, the Sharks play, and it was a night where it was sort of fast afternoon. It was, and it suits those kind of teams. They're the faster teams, the more athletic teams. I, I wouldn't say that... You know, the Dragons have an athletic team um, or a team that plays a, that type of football where they spread to the edges and play some exciting, get it to their centres. So when you talk about excitement, um, you know, you would say that the Broncos are more exciting to watch. But at the same time, is it doesn't matter how you play the football or play the game. As long as you win, it doesn't matter. But I guess for the fans, like you said, You'd rather watch a Broncos that spread the ball around and have a bit of fun with what they do, you know, early kicks, those kind of things. You're most probably not going to get that from the Dragons, but at the same time, they're in the box seat for their own destiny now. Like, if they lose and the Broncos win, they're out. They're minus. Uh, the Broncos are only on two, so the destiny's in their hands. They can control this by themselves, whether they've got boring style of football or not, and the fans that enjoy watching them play, like yourself, it doesn't actually matter, bro, because your opinion <laughs> don't care. You know what I mean? But they are, they are a team that's sitting in the eighth position, consistently haven't been the most consistent team in the eight. Neither have the ones below them. That's why they're below them. But if they can win this game and go on to staying in the eight, you never know what that, the next competition that holds when you get into the, the top eight. So um, unfortunately, bro, like, hey. you, you're entitled to your opinion. Hey. Yeah, it's no offence, Mint. But I, 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 do, I, I agree, they aren't the most exciting team to watch. I think your question is, <laughs> who is who out of those two teams are going to threaten more when yeah, they get yeah. into the eight? Kind of and bad. I think... Or was that the question? Oh, I thought uh, you were, that I was just a boring that, team. That is the like core of the question. I think <laughs> when the Broncos get back Reese Walsh, and if, as the rumours and the stories are saying, Payne Haas might be back before the end of the season, they get those two back, they are a real threat. They become a yeah. threat. If they get into the eight, and I think more of a threat than what the Dragons are because of, you know, take your question as you asked it, the inconsistency, the week in to week out of the Dragons, I don't think they get past week one. Mm. But the Broncos, they're more likely to be a team that threatens and get a, get a win in the playoffs and go a bit further. So, yeah, I think they're more of a, a playoff side than the Dragons are. Yeah. But if the Dragons get in and they, and they earn the right to be the eighth spot, then good on them. Is um, Painas coming back? Well, the rumour was... Well, you the, have to. The story was that he, he didn't have surgery um, at the time and he was going to be back. He could be back before the season ends. He's, he's training and he's running, apparently. Well, yeah, if, it, if he's running and training, he has to be back this weekend. Reese Walsh, no good? I'm not sure what what's the situation what's, How long has that been? Two weeks? No, he, he got his surgery out. straight away for his hand. Should it, be healed up soon. I don't think he'll be back next week, though. So they, they've got to get to at least the third week or semi-final life for yeah. him to play. If they can, if they can beat the, uh, the Dolphins this week at Suncorp, uh, it's a funny one. It's, it's not their home game, but it's at their home ground. For both of, so they get to play there. If they can win that one and set them up and get through without those two, and we, as we're saying... No Bromwich and no uh, uh, Cody Nakarima. There's every chance yeah. that the Broncos could get that one. Well, they got to go. If they make the eight, it's win, win, semi-final. Yeah. GF. That's how they've got to go about it. <sighs> they play the Storm in the last yeah. round. The Broncos. <sighs> yeah. So yeah. The, well, that's oh, this is man. this is the competition you play. <laughs> yeah. No, there's no easy game at in home, this competition. Uh, yeah. Our Storm are uh, massive. Up at Suncorp, yeah, I don't think they do the storm I, I rest anyone. Go. They don't. They so don't. Do they rest someone? Yeah, I think. Well, what happened? Who? Well, the Warriors did the same thing to the. Like, what happened last year? Normally, they do rest the back end. Uh, the storm. They've won. Wrapped up the minor premiers, so they don't aren't forced to actually um, play everyone. But oh. we spoke about their spine. Their spine. I think the spine needs to stay on. Whether they rest Jerome Hughes, I don't want them to rest Jerome Hughes because you can't do that. Um, we need him to play so he gets points to win Dell M. So, yeah, I think the Broncos, they'll have to win to get into the eight and then go win, win, semi for Reese Walsh to play. All right, sweet. Uh, before we go, 
home, go get our lunch, go do whatever. Um, I thought, you know, the season's starting to wind down, sort of go to finals time. It's time to start rating and ranking things and, you know, doing what the people want to hear. So this week I've got together a bunch of the biggest names that have changed club either midway through the season or towards the start of the season. And we're going to get your guys rating out of 10 for each of these signings. All right? Any questions? No. no, no. I'll be okay. hard and fast, bro. Yeah, yeah. Just punch out the numbers and I'll, I'll who, get it all together. The name? So first up. <laughs> <laughs> well, like they can't see what we're talking about, my bro. No, no. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, let me get there. Let me get there. So first up, Kurt Catewell, Broncos to Warriors. What are you giving that out of 10? Um, six. Six. Next up, Herbie Farnworth, Broncos to Dolphins. Eight. Yeah, I like that. Seven. I don't like that as much. Jack White and Raiders to Rabbitohs. Seven. Yeah, once they move him to Harbs, seven. Uh, Justin Olam, Storm to Tigers. Four. Yeah, four. Not quite a five. Raymond Faitala Mariner, Bulldogs to Dragons. Uh, he hasn't, hasn't played enough. Like the games that he did play, I thought, you know, he was good, but I would say a five. I'm a seven. Oosh. Big difference there. Tavita Pungai Jr.'s return to the Dolphins. A uh, four. <laughs> yeah, not long enough. Four. Uh, Connor Tracy, Sharks to Bulldogs. Seven. Kurt Mann, Knights to Bulldogs. Oh, probably difference. Uh, eight for me. Oosh. Eight. Dom Young, Knights to Roosters. Eight. Seven. Josh Curran to the Bulldogs from the Warriors. He's got more of an opportunity this year with um, the Bulldogs, so I'm going to say seven. Eight. Stephen Crichton. Uh, best center in the world right now. I'm gonna say nine. Ish. Not just for what he's done off the on the field, but what he's been off the field. Ten. Cool. I know you disagree with giving out tens. Yeah, I don't give man. anyone a ten. But. <laughs> Spencer Lenu, Panthers to Roosters. Eight. Eight. Uh, Jamin Salmon, Panthers to Bulldogs. Five. Sad to the bro. Yeah, six. <laughs> Bro, the weak got a dog. <laughs> Sean Ball. That's sad to them, bro. <laughs> Sean Ball, bro, I'm going to say seven. Yeah, seven. Luke Brooks. Eight. Mm. Mm-hmm. Eight as well. Dane Laurie, Tigers to Panthers. Yeah, oh, and there's time that he's played in, this, uh, in the fullback position, I'm going to say seven. Six. Uh, Tommy Talau. Oh, bro, he's a different player, isn't he? I'm uh, going to say seven. Yeah, he's, seven. He's really kicked on. Uh, Kai Pierce Paul moved over from yeah, Wigan. like the bro, seven. Seven, taking his opportunity. Morgan Smithies, same, moved bro, over yeah, from Wigan. Yeah, seven, bro, yeah, he's been mean for the middle yep. of the park. Roger, back from <laughs> bro, rugby. Because he's played centre for me, I'm going to say six. Seven. Jake Averillo from the Bulldogs. Um, Jake, yeah, he's been okay. And was he playing centre, eh? Centre. I'm going to say <coughs> six. Six. <coughs> Kyle Flanagan, obviously, before the... Yeah, I'm going to say seven. He's been good. Yeah, him and Ben Hunt. Been a lot better. Found, his, uh, found a consistent run in first grade. Seven. Uh, Tom Eisenhuth from the Storm <laughs> to the Dragons. Ah, uh, Six. Yeah, six. Not really in the headlines, that one. Uh, Christian Tui Pilotu is displaced Ravalawa now on the wing for the Dragons. Hey, how long has he been playing out there for the Dragons for? I think it's been, he's it's been, been quite he's, a few weeks is, now. I think yeah. six, bro. He's, and he's, yeah. he's been strong. He's had a good try scoring rate as well, I, th- I believe. Like, won a game. Uh, Luciano Lelua, Cowboys for Dragons. Um, seven. A seven. Brad Schneider to the Panthers. He hasn't played enough for me. Um, well, he played He played all the time when Cleary was yeah, out six. pretty much. Yeah. Aiden Caesar back from England to I, the Tigers. Yeah, I think he's been seven for me. Yep. 
Seven. And finally, Chanel Harris Tavita back for the Warriors. Um, six. Yeah, I'll go six. All right, so our top signing, according to Run It Straight, Stephen Crichton. Big shock, I know. Uh, no one saw that coming. Second top, tied. We're saying Kurt Mann, Spencer Lenu, and Luke Brooks. Yeah. You agree with that? You yep. reckon those yeah. those are the, like that next tier? And then in the tier below that, Dom Young, Herbie Farnworth. Yeah, that's pretty much it. And then everyone else. But the worst signing of the year. No, no, no that's not That's I'm not saying that. That was just a joke. Well, who is? Well, according to this, according to your guys' takes, it's a tie between Justin Olam and Tavita Mungai Jr. But th- these are only the the biggest names. I didn't go through every signing because no one wants to sit in, listen to you know the reserve grade transfers and stuff like that. No offense, reserve graders, but yeah, shout out to Stephen Crichton. Any thoughts on those top signings? Yeah, well, yeah, Crichton without a doubt for me. Um, like like Willie said. On and off the field, I think his leadership's been second to none. Um, he is, for me right now, the best attacking and defensive centre in the competition. New South Wales was dominant in that position as well. Um, yeah, I think he's been he's been a standout. And I guess his leadership for me with the players around him, the young group of men that he's had, uh, he plays in, a, in a, a tough position where you've got to make a lot of decisions and there's young been some young guys inside and outside him and he's managed to be able to get them to play the best footy that they can as well. So I think he's had a lot of influence on culture, a lot of influence around some of those players to be able to perform consistently week in, week out for the dogs. There's an element of risk and gamble with any signing, um, who, who, regardless of who it is and what they've done in the game. It's Some of it's about how they fit into the club, the new club and the new mm. the new dressing room and how the dressing room takes to them. You know, it's about quality of person as well as quality of talent. And I think all these guys have shown they've got quality talent, which is why clubs have picked them up. But what Stephen Crichton's shown is quality of leadership and quality of character and to try and transform his side and mm. taking some of those winning habits that he got from the Panthers. And obviously he's taken that to the dogs and passed it mm. on. And they speak glowingly about how much he's transformed the place through his everyday habits. That's what Melbourne do. Melbourne's got a team of that. Melbourne's got a club full of that. And that's been coming for generations. Now, that's what he's trying to do now. He's trying to transform that team. So they've all got that habit of winning and, and working in the right way and conducting yourself in a champion way. And then hopefully that transfers if they win something to the club, having that habit. That's mm. the legacy that you pass on as a, as a great leader, but he's been instantly fantastic for that club. Yeah, and a lot of these players, um, whether they get the rating from us or not, I think it, it normally typically goes on the performance of the team, and that's how a lot of players get selected for rep honours, international honours, and that's why some of the marks we've given kind of reflects on the team's performance as well. Um, you can be a standout player, and it will show within the group, but if you've got a a good consistent group together, a team that's playing consistent footy, f- for me, I, I would lift the standard of, of a lot of those players and put them in a higher rating. But if you look at you know where the Warriors finished up, um, hence why the, the ratings that I've given them are, are not as high as some of these teams that are sitting at the top of the table. Um, so that's how I, I see it. And, and, and the players would say the same thing, is when your team's going so well, similar to Mitch Barnett, when your team's going so well, then everyone's doing their job and everyone's playing well. If you go through that team last year, you would put a lot of them sitting at sevens and eights, you know, or eights more than sixes. So I think depending on how the performance of the team goes, is it will depend on the individual, depending on how they've stood out. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like, that's how I kind of done my ratings. Yeah, it's, that. It is, after all, a team sport. Yes. You get all the accolades if your team's going really well, don't sure. you? Sure. So... That's why I've said what I've said. Sweet as. That's all That's all for this one. We'll have some more of these week to week. Boys, be excited for the ratings and rankings. <laughs> Come on, get that, excited. That hey, you always say I have no energy. Get some energy. 
Yeah, well, it's you talking, so um, <laughs> we can't find any energy in when you talk. But anyways, that's us, say eh? We wrap this one up. Um, another beautiful session, or beautiful episode, actually, sorry. Beautiful episode of Run It Straight. Here to your tiding is your ears and your eyes. Thank you so much for tuning in. That was round 25 review and wrap up. Thanks again for everyone that's tuned in to our live this morning at 9.15 to 9.45, which is going universal now. So don't get me uh, wrong. We're in Australia. Most of our people are watching us from over there in the UK and the times. I can't tell you all the times, but something like uh, 7.15 to 7.45. And in the UK, it's 10. 15 or something to 10.45. So thank you so much for tuning in to our lives every Mondays, 9.15 to 9.45. That's another show here on Run It Straight. Thank you, everyone. Again, that's us. Check us out on Spotify. Don't forget, don't forget, don't forget, Fano. before I say that's us, don't forget to go on to all our social media platforms. It is TikTok, Run It Straight. It's also on YouTube, Run It Straight subscribe jump in like it share it tell your final tell your friends and that's another episode